You're listening to A Flare for the Curious. Today on the podcast, Pat Cornett. We're all capable of love. We're all capable of friendship. You just have to be open-hearted. Hey, everybody. My name's Anthony. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. Today on A Flare for the Curious, we talk to my childhood friend, Pat Cornett. Now, I've known Pat for almost 30 years now, but I've only hung out with him a handful of times. So while I invited him on the podcast to talk about his YouTube channel, Nakmoy LA, and the documentary that he recently made about his granduncle, Sakchai Nakpayak, the legendary 1950s Muay Thai fighter who was killed in the prime of his career, we ended up talking about his life, because I'm really curious to fill in the gaps about what I knew about him. So for the first two hours, he really gave us a, an open, heartfelt account of his difficult life and many of the struggles that he overcame and how he did that. I found it really inspiring, and I hope you will too. So if you are interested in hearing us speak specifically about his documentary and Muay Thai and Thai culture, you might want to skip to the third hour. There's some timestamps in the notes down below. But I think you'll be really interested to hear all about Pat's life because he went from growing up here in the States with a single father while his mom was back in Thailand uh, ended up in gangs and then found himself in group homes before joining the U.S. military where he straightened himself out and really kind of learned how to how to be a man. And when he got out, he ended up uh, following a woman that he met to go to college. He cashed in on that GI Bill and got his four years worth and earned a degree so he can turn his passion and skill in art into a career in graphic design. But he sustained an injury in the military and had put on some weight and rediscovered his love for Muay Thai as he healed himself in mind, body, and spirit. And in doing so, he found out that he had a legendary uncle who was has kind of been lost to time. And he's been uncovering details about the man's life and made a really super cool documentary I encourage all of you to go check out. That said, Pat's earning, or excuse me, he's raising funds on a GoFundMe page so he can go back to Thailand and do more research. There's more stories to be told. He's got um, family members that have a robe and he thinks maybe a belt and he'd like to get these items put in a museum to preserve Thai and Muay Thai culture. So I encourage you to go to his YouTube page, Nak Muay LA, check out his documentary, go to his GoFundMe page, make a contribution. All the links are at aflareforthecurious.com. This episode is being brought to you commercial free, and if you find value in the content we're bringing you, I definitely encourage you to head over to Pat's GoFundMe campaign and make that contribution. Everything you need to know is at aflareforthecurious.com. All right, I'll catch you on the other side of this interview, and we'll talk a little bit more. As for now, I hope you enjoy my conversation with my old buddy, Pat Cornett. I'm so glad you were able to find the time to come out. Oh, hey. Well, I'm out of a job right now, so I Yeah, I hear that. I hear off. that. Hopefully, uh, by, by joining us, you'll be able to promote the thing you're doing right now. I think I think it's going to help. So before we get started, I just wanted to, to read your bio so everybody knows who we're talking to. Okay. Um, and you can chime in as we go along the way, uh, correct me and, and add anything in. Um, so... I know you personally as a super humble dude with Ooh. a lot of style and swag. <laughs> uh, you you're all in, you, you and your wife do a lot of dapper events, and you guys get some pretty fly looking photos. Um, but I know you're a super humble dude, so that's why I wanted to read your bio because I know you don't like to brag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you're a U.S. Army veteran, yeah. and you served from 2003 to 2009. Yeah. What was your role when you served? Army tank crew. Uh, well, it's 19 kilo, so it's a tank armor crewman. Tank armor crewman. Yeah. Cool. Um, and you're a graphic designer and artist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're also husband to another amazing artist. And I, I've seen you guys go to events and, and sell your art together. Yeah, she's super cool. Art by, art by Leka, is that right? It, her, her name is pronounced uh, Leka. Leka. Yeah. Art by Leka. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You guys have some, some really cool uh, art that you guys do. Thank and you. And you are a Thai American mm-hmm. and you train Muay Thai and are a combative arts enthusiast. Oh, yeah. Yeah, For so sure. <laughs> combative arts and martial arts, but you're also, uh, your art, you're really interested in, in combat weaponry and fantasy weaponry and, and things like that. Yeah, I'm a big geek when it comes to, like, uh, certain things. Um, I just, you know, 
we're like 80s kids yeah you know what i mean all the, all the high fantasy was like coming out at that time yep yep so i definitely want to get into your art and your interest in, in fantasy art and weaponry mm-hmm. um but i think that's important to point out because it it influences uh the the art that you put out it's your background in in this in this combative arts and, mm-hmm. and whatnot and it, it comes through in in what you're putting out on your youtube channel which is the next thing i want to talk about mm-hmm. so you're the host of knock moy la mm-hmm. a youtube channel dedicated to promoting and preserving thai and muay thai history and culture in la and thailand mm-hmm. and it's also kind of autobiographical in showing your transformation through muay thai and how you bettered yourself and got well and healed and lost yeah, a ton of weight. Spiritually, mentally, just physically, everything. Yeah. So it's it's preserving and promoting culture as well as uh, an awesome an awesome testimony to your transformation, which is super cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and recently on your channel, you made a documentary about your legendary great uncle, Sakchai Nakpayak, mm. who during an impressive rise to Muay Thai success was murdered during the height of his career. And you're currently fundraising. Uh, you have a GoFundMe page to go back to Thailand to do more research as well as to acquire artifacts from your family to get them to put in a museum for the proper preservation of this magnificent Muay Thai legend. Correct. And you intend to make your 30 minute film into a feature length production and you continue to find more details. um... Yeah, stuff's coming in like uh, almost weekly. I just found out recently that he had a kid, the girl that he was defending. We'll, we'll get into that, but yeah. she was three months pregnant. So, I, yeah, even uh, looking at the comments under the video, people are chiming in. You have somebody who's going to help you to uh, interpret what you narrated into Thai. Uh, mm-hmm. So it's still unfolding. Uh, you said your family has you know, robes, maybe even a belt, and that it's yeah. not just a personal interest. It's for the culture, and you're going to get this stuff put in a museum. Yeah, and so, the reason why is because... Um, most of like Thai culture and and old school like Muay Thai dudes from like past the seventies, there's really nothing on them. It's just word of mouth. Yeah. And all the artifacts or memorabilia is just gone, destroyed through time. Because I, I don't know, it's like Thai people sometimes uh, they don't worry about that stuff. It's very Buddhist, mm-hmm. you know. So they just let things go. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I want to I want to get into all that stuff. I'm going to talk about your documentary. I think um, your transformation is going to really inspire people when they hear it. But I also want to really promote the documentary. But before we get into all that, um, I want to tell you why I think it's uh, kind of like an auspicious coincidence that I'm having you as my first guest. Uh, it's it's pretty special for me. This is my first recording. I reached out to a bunch of people, um, but it just happens to be you're the one who booked it first. So I want to tell you about that, and then maybe we can back it up, and you can kind of... I just gave the overview of your your uh, credits, but I want you to kind of give us your bio. I know you were born in the States, and then you grew up in Thailand and came back, mm-hmm. uh, had a difficult time through high school, and then joined the Army. And So you've got this, this Phoenix Rising narrative that keeps coming up in your life, Yeah, you know, and then... I, I really identify with that, and I think people are going to get into it. So I want to hear your version of your life. But first, let me just tell you why. <clears throat> it's super cool for me that, that you decided to, to book as the first guest on this podcast. So when I think of you, in my mind, as my friend, I think of new beginnings. <laughs> so you're my oldest friend in terms of people that I'm still in contact with. Mm. Um, I met you in 1991 when I moved to California from New York. <laughs> yes, and you had a thick accent. <laughs> yeah, <remember>. New York. <laughs> yeah, I used to get mad. Yeah, yeah, I used to fight on the playground over a pronunciation <laughs> at eight years old. But I, I thought that was cool, though. Yeah, yeah, it was fun, you know, as kids. So, as one of my oldest friends, I think it gives an opportunity for people to to hear that story that I that I came from New York and that I I uh, came here at California, came mm-hmm. here to California. It, I, I came from a pretty tumultuous situation in New York, and so I came to California, and you're a little bit older than I am. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm eight, and how, how, how much older? What year are you? So I was born in 79. 79. So, yeah, you're, I'm 83, so you're four years older than me. Uh-huh. So I'm eight, you're 12 already. <laughs> and yeah. so I had a pretty crazy life back in New York, and I was already, you know, the, na- the name of this podcast is A Flair for the Curious, because I've always been curious and into, into weird things. So I was already getting into trouble in New York, and I come to California, and I meet this older kid, and he's like, 
hey, you want to smoke some cigarette butts out of my dad's ashtray? <laughs> and I'm like, hell yeah, why wouldn't we smoke cigarette butts out of your dad's ashtray? Oh, was a bad kid. Yeah, you know, but I was all about it, you know. So to have you as an older influence was, um, for me, it was great. My mom hated it. Uh, you know, your, your, the kind of art that you're interested in, uh, we can talk more about that later, like Boris cards, you know, it's oh my like God. this like Conan the Barbarian style art and a lot of the women are scantily clad or yeah. exposed and my mom was not very happy <laughs> um so that's kind of how i know you it's this this new beginnings that's really uh special for me to have you here because when i came to california that was a new start for me mm-hmm. and this podcast is hopefully going to be a, a new start and a new direction for for me to to share my interests so part of doing this podcast also um i noticed like uh, i don't like to be the center of attention okay and having a podcast where I'm the host every episode puts me a little bit at the center of attention in that I'm the host, but I get to highlight what my other my friends are doing and people I care about are doing. I feel the same way when I first started making videos. Um, like, I, I can be shy. I can be, you know, but I also have a uh, go forward attitude. Um, but I, I kind of got over it really yeah. quick. Because yeah. I, what I put out there, I feel like it's fun and, and you know, I don't know how long I'm going to be here. Yeah. So let's yeah. do it. I definitely <laughs> have had a lot of fun watching your channel. Yeah, so maybe we share that it's a little bit therapeutic and putting ourselves out there, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know I used to wait tables and to have to go up to people like over and over, Hi, my name's Anthony, like blah blah blah. It was a uh, it was a little bit therapeutic and getting me out of my shell. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm really personable but I have a hard time going up to people. But getting to feature you and my friends and cool people and what they're doing, it's uh it takes a little bit of the pressure off. I wrote this article about one of my teachers, Dr. Darwi Long. He rediscovered this um, this rare Chinese manuscript in uh, a language that is more or less extinct, the Tangut language. Mm. The Tangut people, there's some some uh, shadow around what actually happened, but they may have killed Genghis Khan. Oh, wow. So the Mongolians came in and uh, it's the, one of the first recorded genocides and wiped out the Tangut people. So their language more or less became extinct. Mm. And so he rediscovered this manuscript in Poland after uh, the Germans ended up getting it, after it got sent there after the Boxer Rebellion of 1900. They looted in China, mm-hmm. got sent to Europe. Germany ended up with it. And when Germany was losing the war, they sent uh, a lot of their treasures to other countries. And so, you know, isn't it crazy? Like they would just like loot all like you know, old artifacts and stuff like that, because I think they were into some like really occult kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely some occult stuff going on there. Um, so they sent some of their treasures to this one castle where Hitler was actually supposed to go, but as history tells it, he didn't make it. So Poland ended up with all these manuscripts and a lot of treasures. And although Germany has been trying to get them back, they haven't conceded. Poland's like, no, you left it here. (laughs) Uh Um, so anyway, so there's all these like manuscripts in Jagiellonian university in, in Poland. And they're kind of all bundled together and they're not really organized. And so my professor's going through them, just taking pictures and he finds one. It's indigo with gold type on it. And he's a, he's a scholar of uh, ancient printing techniques and he recognizes it as, as this language. Mm-hmm. He checks in with uh, a scholar of Tengutology in China, verifies it. And it's like this amazing discovery. So I write this article, tell that story and kind of let it be. And it's on the blog for my, my school, University of the West. And I kind of, I put it to the side and he's like, oh, thanks. That's great. He starts getting calls from people and emails from professors. Some want to work with him, have him come to their school and do lectures. Some are calling to say they're jealous that he found it and they didn't. (laughs) And so every time I bump into this professor in the hallway, he's always telling me he's getting more, more acclaim from this article I did. The the blog itself is kind of not even popular. It's not ongoing. It's not being regularly used, but people who follow our school still follow it. Mm -hmm. So... I get so much joy out of seeing how fulfilled he is by me doing that piece on him. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that by highlighting the awesome work you're doing and the other people I'm going to be interviewing that I can get your word out there and, and yeah, really enjoy seeing your success. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Cause I, I really support what you're doing out there. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. So let's get back into your story. Okay. So let's, uh, let's just touch on, on your bio. So you're, you're the parent of people from two very... Di- you're the child of parents from two very different cultures. And oh, yeah. And that alone is very interesting. So your dad's from Kentucky. Yeah. And your mom's from Thailand. Right. What happened? Well, um, from what I understand, uh, he was definitely not a sex tourist. All right? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
my dad, you know, later on he moved from Kentucky and, and uh, was later raised in Virginia. And um, I think he just got tired of the small town situation, you know. He wanted to see the world and he wasn't okay with just being stuck in one town, I think, you know. And he want, So he joined the military. He started off in the Air Force. Um, made his way up to, what was it, I think E6, uh, ranking, um, and after that, he worked in intelligence. Uh, the CIA actually picked him up. Yeah, that's what I thought, in my mind, I was trying to remember what your dad did, and I was like, is he intelligence? Yeah, so, um, he used to decipher Morse code, and, uh, there's a lot of things that he he uh, took to the grave, you know. He wouldn't tell me. You yeah, know? that's the job, right? <laughs> yeah, but he's deciphered some codes before and caught some bad guys. Yeah, for this country, and I thought that was pretty cool. But that's about it. That's all he was able to tell me. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess he was on duty uh, sometime in Thailand in the seventies, and um, or late sixties, early seventies, and that's where he met my mom. Um, I believe she was a waitress at a restaurant and, uh, they were together 10 years before they had me. Um, they, uh, and, and, you know, my dad, he's a very respectful, uh, uh, type of gentleman, you know, uh, he's, he's very polite, very old school gentleman. So and he fit in Thai culture. He did. Cause I noticed you have a lot of that, that humble attitude and, I always thought like it was a little bit weird until I went to Thailand and I see, Oh, he's, it's like instilled in you. So that makes sense of why your dad was fit there. Let me just stop you real quick for that 10 years before you were born. Was your, was that primary, was your dad hanging out in Thailand most of the time? Um, I think so. Um, I have to ask my mom. I didn't get too much into it. It's just, it took them 10 years to have me mm-hmm. because there was something going on with my mom's biological situation. So she had to actually go with my dad to, Oman, um, he had a job out there afterwards, and then she was able to get some kind of medication to get her um, her cycle going in the correct direction for for them to have me. Yeah. So it took about ten years. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And then you were born in the states. So was that her first visit here? Did he we brought her out here? Yeah. Um, she met the family and everything, and. Um, I still have yet to go out there and meet them. Your pop side of the family? Yeah, I've never met them. Um, there were some some issues that he had um, with the older siblings, I guess. Um, he he can he although he's a gentleman, he can be very stubborn. Yeah, and he will just like take it to the grave. He would rather you reach out to him, you know. Especially if he didn't feel like he did anything wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, my mom, everybody liked my mom from what I understood, you know. Um, and then when my dad was in Thailand, he was very like traditional of doing the, the Y, uh, the Thai greeting. Um, just very humble and polite with the family and they loved him a lot. Actually, when, when my parents divorced, uh, my grandmother... She was just very disappointed. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any have any intention of reuniting with your dad's side of the family? Actually, I've reached out to them on uh, Facebook, and um, I know you know they're they're a little bit different. You know, um, I'm a California kid, and uh, some of them are really cool, and but um, I'm not. I have to I have to go there to find out for myself you know, how they really are, and um, regardless, I'm blood. Yeah. So it doesn't matter. Carry the name, right? <laughs> it's just it's just um, really hard to, to balance going to see them and go to Thailand to see family at the same time. It's very hard, you know, with... Time and money, you mean? Yeah, life in general in, in America. You yeah. Know? You only have so much time to do what you're allowed to if you're working for somebody. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. It's hard. Well, I'll I'll be curious to hear how that, that turns out later on as we stay in touch. Oh yeah. So 
you're born here, mm -hmm. and then you go back to Thailand. Yeah. How long? Uh, how old were you when you went back to Thailand? I have to say about maybe like one, maybe. Just a little kid. Just yeah, a little baby. just uh, yeah. So then you're growing up in Thailand. Mm -hmm. How how long were you there for? I was there up until I was like maybe six years old. Okay. Yeah. Did you start school like a kindergarten? Yeah, yeah I went to kindergarten in Thailand. Nice. Uh, got into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Started early. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I don't know. I just I don't know. I, I don't know what the deal is. You know, it's just maybe it's my mom's side because she can be kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I have a sneaking suspicion it's maybe something we share in common that this curiosity, like when you wonder about, well, what else is up out there? Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> what else is going on? Well, why are you doing that? You know, people don't like it. Mm -hmm. you, you, our, my curiosity has led me to question why things are the way they are. Mm -hmm. And people don't like that because okay. it makes, you know, people feel comfortable in the routine and what's normal. Mm -hmm. And so if you're disruptive, if you want to, you know, be loud in school or challenge the teacher, like that doesn't fly. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think I think we share that. So I don't think when kids misbehave, it's because they're malicious and have any bad intent. But right. it's it's you know seen as trouble because it's disruptive to the normalcy, right? From the status quo. Well, I think it's um, I didn't really understand, and I'll get into that in a second. I, I didn't really understand um, the hurt that I was causing on other kids because they were doing it to me. So there's like two instances that I can remember in Thailand and my mom was like, no, three instances. Um, my mom was like super upset at me. Um, this one kid, he was bigger than me and he was kind of like picking on me and stuff. And um, while he wasn't looking, I picked up a chair and cracked him in the back of the head. Yeah. And another kid that was picking on me, there's these like wooden blocks. They're about the size of like, you know, mini bricks. And I picked it up and I threw it at his head and... Um, I got in trouble with that, but I never said that these guys were picking on me first. Uh, you know what I mean? I was just mostly silent about it. <laughs> Cause I, yeah. you know, did you experience violence in the home or where did you get the idea to, to be aggressive like that? Well, I, I know my mom, she's very old school. I mean, she'll take out like a, a stick or whatever and just like, you know, smack me on the bottom with it or yeah. whatever. But, um, it was never a, like abusive, abusive. It was just, at the time, you know, um, you take out your belt. It, yeah. it, it seemed like that's how you do it. <laughs> it was the thing to do, you know. Uh, nowadays, it's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I hear that. Cool. So you're in Thailand, causing mm -hmm. some trouble. Is that why you came back to the states? Because you were, I getting, you were so. getting in trouble. I believe so. I think my mom was just um, she couldn't really uh, deal with it, and and you know what, she was on her own trip too. You know, she kind of remarried after, and she had. Um, I have a half brother, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah, you've never met him. He lives in Thailand. No, he's with my mom now. Um, Where? In Las Vegas. Oh, okay. Your mom's yeah. in Vegas right now. Yes, she is. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. That makes it a lot easier to visit. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, uh, his father actually ended up uh, killing himself, so that's how Sorry. she had to, um, uh, you know, take custody and stuff. So, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I. It's hard for me because, you know, I love my mom and um, at the same time, we don't always, you know, see eye to eye. And uh, I think she was just trying to find herself. Yeah. And because she could have kept me, you know, but I also think that she knew that being with my father, because she was, she was unstable. Yeah. You know, she's just bouncing around and she thought it was better that I came to the U.S., which... Yes and no. Yeah. Yes and no. I've had some. So clear. I've had some experiences coming back, and I wonder sometimes, you know, what I would, how I would have turned out should I have stayed with family mm -hmm. in Thailand. Yeah, we never know. Those decisions are hard, right? Yeah. Yeah, good and bad. She might have been not as stable as she wanted to be, but living in Thailand is different than America. It is. <laughs> it might have just been better because it was more simple. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, a mother does what she thinks is best. And, you know, she obviously trusted your father to take care of you. And, and I'm sure he did his best. Yeah, but I, I ended up losing that um, big family atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You grew up with siblings. And, and that's why I was so very quick to get friends. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter what color they were. It didn't matter, like, um, 
what backgrounds they came from. I, you know, when you're a kid, you just want friends. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And growing up a uh, only kid, you grow up a lonely kid. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And especially if you have a single parent. Yep. And your dad was a pretty quiet guy, from what yeah. I remember. Yeah, but strict. Strict, too. But not always there. Yeah. Because of work. Yeah, I know. That's why we were smoking cigarettes in the house, right? Because <laughs> he was never there. We could always just hang out at, at your house. Yeah. That was yeah. that was kind of like the fun escape pad. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I guess I, I, I've i got a comment and a question. My comment is that it's been beautiful to see you reconnect with family over the years. Like you and I haven't spent a lot of time face to face over the years, but now that the neural network has extended to satellites and <laughs> yeah. where we're connected through first it was MySpace and then Facebook. I've gotten to, to periodically see you reconnect with family mm-hmm. and now seeing uh, the documentary and all that. That's been beautiful for me to, to passively witness from afar to see you have that reconnection. Cause I ca- like loosely knew that, that you were somewhat estranged from them. Yeah. So that's been really beautiful. It's good to have family. I'm really happy to see it, to, to hear you say that. Yeah. yeah. So my question though is, so, I know you started to get into trouble in high school. Before that. Well, uh, yes. <laughs> very <laughs> since, bad. So, since Thailand, right? But, but, um, very bad, though. But I guess I'm, I'm alluding to you started hanging out with gangs. Yeah. And so, my question is, do you think that your lack of uh, a family environment kind of pushed you towards the family environment of gangs? Definitely. Um, wow. That's, you know... Um, it's kind of hard to talk about this, uh, but I will, you know, it's, it's, it's a part of me that I kind of just, um, tried to bury, I guess. Um, yeah, we don't have to pick it apart too much, but I right. think it's an important part of your story because yeah. you keep you keep rising. So you, you had that trouble and then you went into the army. So yeah. as much as you want to talk about, it, I'd love, I'd love to hear about what that was like for you. Well, um, I mean, it, it's, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, you know, it's, Sometimes you just feel like, you know, you're, you're not safe, you know. I mean, um, there's been times where I've just been beat up, you know. <laughs> um, even before, like, hanging out with, like, gangs and stuff, you know. And it just kind of sucks. And, um, But, yeah, you know, you your friends, when you're young, your friends become your family, you know. And it didn't matter. And, and you want to feel safe, you know. Um, it's like when you have a parent, you know, you, you feel 10 feet tall because you got your, your big parent there to protect you or whatever, you know, and you just don't, you know, when you're on the street a lot and you're just so many hours, just being a kid without any, you know, family or whatever, you're going to long for something. We all feel like we need to belong somewhere and coming to America, it's just, it, it was a culture shock. I didn't even speak English before I came back. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was a tough time for my dad to um, try to communicate with me. and But I later picked it up because I was young. You know? Yeah. Did your dad speak Thai? Very little. Very little. Um, but uh, you know, we lived in Long Beach. We moved all over. Mm-hmm. We lived in many different places. Um, but, you know, going to coming to America versus being in Thailand, it was just really, wow. Like look at all these different, you know, cultures and ethnicities here. And, um, I just wanted to play, but it was really hard because, you know, it was hard to communicate. And then, and then even when you're very young, you, you experience the, uh, the racial stuff, you know what I mean? And I didn't know, um, why, you know, people felt like that. Um, and it was hard to, like, look at yourself in the mirror as a kid. Like, you know, why do people, like, you know, dislike me, you know? I mean, when I was growing up in the 80s, um, you would think, like, you know, Asians were, like, super cool. Because you you still have Bruce Lee on the, on the <laughs> you know, you got Ernie Reyes Jr., the guy that um, was Kino and uh, Ninja Turtles. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I used to always, like, mimic him, you know, his sounds, because he was in, uh, what was it, um, The Last Dragon, oh. you know, and, and 
I used to go, ah, yeah, ah, yeah. And, like, and I had the same, like, bowl haircut and yep. everything. Yeah, that's, that's how I remember you as a kid. Yeah. yeah and there's a famous picture of us, like, uh, at that age. You, you got that, that that bowl cut. It's looking classic. Yeah, and so I just, I was just like, why, you know? And so, yeah, I kind of, like, gravitated, gravitated towards hanging out with um, people who I felt like I felt strong around, mm-hmm. you know, because I didn't feel confident and... Um, and yeah, you know, you, you need friends, you need family. And, and at the time I felt like it was the right thing for me Yeah. to make it. And you ended up hanging out with Mexican gangs. Is that right? Not the Asian gangs. Actually this, well, first starting out, I didn't care where they were from. Yeah. You know what I mean? They were black. I've hung out with black gang members. I've hung out with Asian gang members, Mexican gang members, um, the people that I hung around with had actually uh, multiple ethnicities. Oh, okay. I'm not going to say... Was it because it was more like... I know you were really into uh, like graffiti art as a kid. It started off like a tagging crew, and then you got into yes. more aggressive gangs? Is that why? I think so, yeah. It started off like that because I I was really moved by the graffiti art yeah. uh, movement that was happening. And, and I wanted to express my art in, in, in different colorful ways. Um and, and what seemed like was cool at the time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, later, after getting towards high school, I actually was only in high school for like maybe a month or two and they kicked me out, mm-hmm. you know. I was just wasn't going by the rules and ditching yeah. and, and dress codes and all that, which is, I think, one of the main things that was bothering me was the dress code situation. Like, hey, I'm here to learn, you know what I mean? yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, pretty much everything you wore was on the list of what not to wear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the big like the the logo, the graffiti logos, and the big pants. Yeah, yeah. I had like so many like tagger shirts too. Yeah, just, like, yeah. Turn your shirt inside out, and yeah, as I like just... as a kid, let me just say, like, I thought you were super cool. Like, oh man, this guy is like, because <laughs> like you got like the the nerd thing going and the gangster thing going, yeah. so you're like the coolest fanboy <laughs> before I even knew what that was. And so you know, as a little kid, like. I it really wish <laughs> I really really wish I had a bigger brother to kind of just like you know just smack me around a little bit like what the fuck are you doing you know what I mean um, but yeah so I ended up um, going to juvenile hall because they put me in this kind of like a probation school it was like a continuation or something but you were assigned a probation officer mm. you didn't even do a crime but if but going to other these places and um it was very far they made me go to east la to to go to this one school and i was just like dude i can't make it out here every day you know so by default not going you're breaking the rules so you go to jail oh shit they took me away at like i don't know maybe 14 years old damn yeah, and I I grew up in and out of the system because uh, I would run away <laughs> and then like go back to the streets. I was into drugs and stuff too. It's just, um, but the police will catch you. You know, I always gave them my name because you know what? Like I didn't always like staying out on the streets. So yeah, sometimes they'd like get the hell out of here or whatever. I'm like, fuck. Okay, well, so I I definitely, um, but I would run away and and I would go back I I wasn't released until I was like maybe 19 they didn't let me go until I was like 19 wow yeah because they can keep you up until you're 21 wow yeah that's crazy I don't know what it is like nowadays but you know um I was kind of forced to um uh abide by the rules at this last place I went to it was in Compton it was a group home out there and uh actually it was the worst of the worst it was like your last stop like, yeah that's where all the bad kids that have been kicked out of every single group home uh you know that was the last stop and my first week there i got into a fight with a guy from you know a different gang but i i initiated it mm. because in my mind i was like you know i gotta live here you know and i told him like oh, hey well you know i know we don't like get along so um i say we just duke it out and then get over it 
you know, we both handled our business, you know, and then, uh, needless to say, you know, he kind of quit. He was like, okay, I had enough, you know, and that was fine, you know, okay, we moved on and, and smoking joints and stuff like that. And the group home, you know, uh, this is like, like, like I said, this is the most like ghetto group home that you will ever, this is like guys were getting beat up, you know, uh, yeah. and this was my last stop, you know, and I made it through there somehow. You know, because many all different gangs were were in there. Other kids were getting like abused, and um, there was some messed up stuff that happened yeah, in bet. that one place. But my probation officer officer told me it was like, you know, this is your last stop. And if you don't make it here, then um, I'm just gonna lock you away. Damn. Yeah, because you're already like uh, gonna be 18, so you know, I could try you as an adult. So did you have like a, a change of heart, a change of mind? You decided to change your attitude while you were in there because you wanted to not get locked up or what happened? It was a combination of things because I was just like, you know, I I can't see myself living like this. You know, what the heck am I going to do? You know, um, I, I, I was I always excelled in school, you know. Um, I always did try to do the right thing. It was just sometimes... You get thrown into circumstances and, and, and what you feel is right for the time for your own survival because yep. it's a jungle out there. Yeah. You know, people die every day, you know, just for looking at somebody the wrong way, you know. Um, and I didn't feel like my dad from, you know, my dad was a nonviolent guy and he will not like he would rather call the police first before like trying to throw and get into a fight with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, I, Maybe I don't know. He will try, but he, I, you know, he's not a fighter. You know what I mean? He's yeah. a, he's a lover. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, um, yeah, I didn't feel safe. You know, um, so yeah, I wanted to change, and and also at the time, me and my dad weren't getting along. You know, and I love my dad, but I felt kind of betrayed because he also, um recommended it to the judge that I should, you know, get locked up. It was it was him and the um probation officer at that school I was telling you about. And um he had this like uh notebook that he would write down events of what I did. And you know what? I in a way I, I thank him. At the time I didn't. Uh, I yeah. just had this animosity towards him. Of course. You know? But this older black lady, I, I'll never forget her name. Her name is Miss Yarborough. She's the owner of the place. You know, she couldn't really um, have eyes on on every kid, but being growing up with black, it was mostly a black-owned group home, and there was mostly black kids. You had maybe a couple Asians, um, a couple Mexicans, but it was mostly black kids that were like crips and bloods you mm -hmm. know what i mean and they yeah. would fight all the time you know but she showed me the importance of family you know um and and it was really good to get to know her and 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 everybody else there because when when black people come together it becomes like a family i i even the gang members, they'll put it aside to be, because the people that she had running the place was also her family. So there was oh. a guy named Reverend Henderson. You know, uh, he had like the craziest Jerry curl, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he was a reverend, you know, and most of the, a lot of the kids listened to the people there. And, and we would go out to the beach together on outings if you were good, you know, and I never, I never had that at another group home, even yeah. though it was ghetto, you know, it's crazy, family. you know, kids would jump over the fence and beat up like homeless guys. It was really bad, oh, dude. Man. Like, uh, other gangs would come by and shoot at these like, uh, Crips and Bloods or whatever that were there. Um, it was scary, man. It was off That's of crazy. El Segundo and Santa Fe. Right. And, um, I'm sometimes I would jump the fence and get a wino to like buy me some like, you know, Thunderbird or like some night train or something yeah. like that, you know, and then I'll hook them up because they would give us allowances. Like 
these people are crazy. They should have never <laughs> gave us allowances, you know? <laughs> yeah. But the state would also pay for your, like, a clothing allowance. Okay. And so we would just go and get, like, the coolest Nikes and whatever was fresh at the time, you yeah. know? Um, but this one group home, you know, I, I, got, I got to learn what it was like to, like, you know, eat um, pig feet and just, like, that um, soul food, just, you know, experience. Yeah. You know? I don't feel like... Everything that's going on right now, I think that the more people spend time with each other and, and kind of living with each other, because I was forced into that situation, yeah. but we're not all that different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the hatred that you're talking about in the country and everything. Yeah. Hatred comes from fear and ignorance. Yeah. Like not stupid, but ign- you're, you're unfamiliar. Mm-hmm. You just haven't been around people to right. see that they're like you. <laughs> yeah. It's just... Yeah. Yeah, so we that's have, interesting we, you had that exposure in that capacity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only thing that we have really that is distinct or different is our food mm-hmm. and our skin color. But everything else, we're all capable of love. We're all capable of friendship. Yep. You just have to be open-hearted. And I've always had respect, and I think that's why I got out of that place. Mm-hmm. But Miss Yarbrough brought me and my dad together, and we broke we broke down crying. We were hugging yeah. outside the place, you know. You could hear all these other kids like snickering and laughing or whatever because my dad's a white guy. Yeah, you know what I mean. It was like you adopted, you know. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, no, Those hecklers, man. man. Yeah, but yeah, you guys are having your moment. Yeah, yeah, it- and it was tough because after I got out of there, it was really hard to transition because you're so used to being in, I I say that I got more involved. I actually got more involved with like gang life being in the group homes. Yeah. Because you're surrounded by it. You know what I mean? Yeah, of course. And you got to rep. You you have to live your life. Like that's how you survive. Yeah. You get, and you have to fight, you have to fight or you're a punk. Yep. You know, because they're going to, con- they're going to see that and they're going to continue to like mess with you, you know? So you ha- you have to learn quick. You have to- yeah. So you're learning all these coping skills, but I'm hearing that you're also learning these connection skills and this, this family environment and yeah. thinking about something bigger than just that fighting. And I, and I wanted to get out of there, you know, because there's, there's people that hold animosity. I don't know if the guy that I got into a fight with, cause I heard later on he, who, when he was in jail, he talked to another buddy of mine you know from mm-hmm. the same crew and he was like oh yeah i beat up your 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 homeboy <laughs> you know patrick or whatever you know but that was bs i think he was just trying to like intimidate my friend you know um i was like that never happened that's not how it went down you know what i mean yeah but i don't know he acted like he was cool but he people bury stuff deep inside you know what i mean yeah i don't know had i stayed there longer or whatever he would have came back and shot at me just because, you know, I won the fight, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's all an opportunity to take your internal pain and put it on somebody else. So mm-hmm. anybody that you have an interaction with becomes a target. Right? Yeah. And still, I was like a big nerd, even though I was like, in, in that, I was, all I did was either did my best at school. Um, I, I even tried taking my GED, but I failed because of time. I wasn't very a fast. I wasn't a very fast reader at the time, mm-hmm. and that, you know, my math skills were good, but my reading was a little bit slow. And because all I re- ever read was comic books, yeah, you know what I mean. So my vocabulary wasn't very big at the time. Um, they sent us to an outside school. I think it was in Pico Rivera, and. Um, this teacher, he, 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 I could see it in him that he knew that, you know, I wasn't there to BS around. I was trying to, you know, do good in school. Is this while you're in the group home? Yeah. Uh-huh. We went to an outside school because they could no longer, uh, we had a bungalow when I first came there and they were just having kids trashed. read kids. <laughs> no, not that. It's just that the, the education that they were giving us was because you got to remember some of these kids, uh, they can't even read past or do math past like a second grade level. I knew a guy that couldn't even spell his name. Yeah. And that was the guy that I got into a fight with, actually. He couldn't even spell his name. Um, 
So they decided to send us to an outside school with uh, a continuation school with other kids that were like dropouts and stuff like that. So these were kids that got to live at home and stuff like that. Um, but I eventually, you know, uh, this is a long story. It's, you know, I, I made it out of that and um, I ended up getting my high school diploma. Cool. Instead of a, a GED, because in my mind, I had a feeling that employers, when they see that, um, they're going to be like, oh, he has a GED. Yeah. That means something's up with him. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I didn't like that, you know. So I was very strategic. I'm very a very strategic person. Yeah. <laughs> and anyways, I made it out of that group home. I rekindled my, my relationship with my dad. But coming back, transitioning... When you look a certain way, like you got punk rockers and, you know, you have people who dress hip hop. It's, it's, it's their style. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I was still, and and, and I had friends that were still banging, you know, yeah. and they knew where I lived and came and picked me up and, and I had nothing else. I was, I felt stuck, you yeah. know, like I didn't, I didn't know what the hell was, was going to happen. And, and I, you need friends. You can't be alone. And then also you're a young guy. You want to be hooking up with all these, like, you know, easy chicks that, you know. Um, it's just, It was just the times, man. The 90s. You have all the energy, but none of the focus of where to, <laughs> to put it, right? Yeah. And, and then I know personally for me, like, uh, when I, I had a big life change, yeah, you, you feel stuck. Like, all the people that I know are going to get me into that old trouble. Yeah. In essence, you have to let the old you and that old life and those old, some of those old relationships die to be reborn into something new, and that's not an easy process. No, it's not. So what what was the transition from coming out of the home and having that lifestyle? How did you end up in the Army? Well, it took several uh, events. Um, when I came back, I, you know, I, I, I love my dad, but he was still very disappointed in me. And, and a lot of times, like, all I ever did was try to make him proud, you know? And I was about, yeah, 19. And, you know, I, I, I hadn't fully changed yet as far as appearance goes. My temperament's always been chill, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but uh, he's made this comment. It's like, you haven't changed. I was like, damn. And... I started looking for a job. It was really hard. You know, nobody wanted to hire like somebody with a shaved head and stuff, you know, and, um, I've been let go like a week later just for no reason, Mm -hmm. you know, just, um, and it just, it, it felt horrible not being able to find work because you have good intentions Mm -hmm. and I didn't realize the impact first appearances make on people mm-hmm. you know they look at you like one minute and they're like no yeah uh-uh. you know and so not uh one night uh i actually got arrested for something i didn't even do i was hanging out with somebody and we uh did a uh halloween prank but i was just there and i was I was 19 and it was on Halloween and this guy was, you know, maybe we'll scare this, this, this guy real quick, you know, and, uh, cause we were trying to score booze and, um, he walked up to him, just pranked him, just kind of like, give me your money or whatever, you know, now me being his friend, I know he, he didn't fucking mean it, you know, yeah. it was just kidding, you know, and uh, and we were just laughing and joking or whatever, and we're like, "Come on, let's just fucking go," you know. This guy took um, he was a big, tall Asian dude too. I was like, "There's no way this guy is gonna," you know. He's got a. I thought that he knew that this kid wasn't serious, mm-hmm. you know. We're just what a ask, you know. Um, but he wrote down one of my friend's uh, license plate, and they tracked him down, and then they gave everybody's name up. And they came to my house, oh, man. you know, and the police arrested me and started oh, asking me all these kind of questions. And um, I was like, well, I didn't do shit. I was drunk. I don't remember anything. Well, 
they say that you did this and this and that, you know? And I was like, what? And so later on, I went to court uh, with my buddy and my dad got a lawyer. We're trying to say that, you know, we weren't doing what they're trying to say that we were doing, you know? And the story kept on changing from the defendant. Mm. They would never come in. Um, mm. So at first we had a gun. First, then we had a knife. And then it was a screwdriver, <laughs> you know? And So it even, got dismissed then? No, it didn't. Oh, God. <laughs> they said, you know what? We're going to try you anyways. We want you to plead no contest. What? Did and you? I did because I didn't. I don't know the. I didn't know the law. Yeah, that's how the justice system is. They convince people to, yeah, to do stuff like that. You know, because I wish I had somebody with experience to tell me, like, you know, that, you know, you didn't do anything. So why, are you, you know, so I got three years probation, uh, and ninety days of Caltrans, and it sucked, man, because. You're working for free. Yeah. You're busting your ass for free for something you didn't even do, right? Um, but the judge said, if I was good in a year and a half and did everything that I needed to do, she let me go. Mm-hmm. Okay? So I'm a determined type of individual. Yeah, you are. <laughs> so I got it done. I quit my job. I was, I was working this really sucky job at the time, too. I was just, like, walking around selling artwork. Mm-hmm knocking on people's doors and stuff was, your own or other people's um it was, it was reproduction it was for a company uh-huh. reproduction lithographs of like picasso's van door to door yeah Damn. business to business, business you know oh yeah, yeah but i would hitch a ride with somebody at the time too because i was just yeah. i just didn't own a car or nothing you know that's hard work man it was it's tough walking around in the sun with it's like also demoralizing because you're probably not selling very many pieces no some there were good days and there were like really bad days you yeah. know and um so I had quit that job and, or took time time off from it, and just to do this Caltrans thing, you know. While I was doing it, I had a uh, probation officer meeting, and I went to go see my probation officer, and he says, "So, have you been doing your um, your Caltrans?" I was like, "Yeah, I've been doing it." Can I see the the proof? And I says, "Well, I can't. Uh, when you go there." Because um, it's known that once you get there by 7 a.m., they won't give you your hours that you did until um, after you're done. And I Wait, you're done with the day? Or with the done? day, with okay. the day. Okay. And so basically um, the probation officer said, I, you better get that paperwork. I said, because I don't believe you. And I was just like, how can you say this to me, man? Give me a, give me the next time I meet you. So, you know? Yeah. And um, I was like, what the hell am I going to do? So He wanted you to provide the paperwork by the end of your meeting in that sitting in front of him? No, uh, to come back. Come back. To get the paperwork and come back to him. Uh-huh. And there's no way because they're all out. They're done. Once you're, you go to arrive to this yard... There's nobody that's going to be there. Uh, they bring, they're out. Yeah, they're out. Doing, doing it. Yeah. And uh, so I called up a public defender and I told him what was going on. Um, and I says, I promise you, I will bring that paperwork when I go to court because, uh, yeah, I already knew. I, I got a, a court appearance in the mail or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard going back because this is like way over a decade. Yeah, that's cool, yeah. man. <laughs> um, so I arrived at court and the judge was like, well, um, where is your uh, lawyer? I said, we can't afford one anymore. You know, Well, your probation officer says that you're not following the rules, so I'm just going to lock you up for a year. And I was like... Your Honor, but you don't want to hear my side of the story. She says, no, I don't. And I motioned to the public defender. So I got the paper. And he's like, excuse me, Your Honor, I've been speaking with, you know, Mr. Cornette over the phone. and um, The public defender stood up and said this. Yeah. When he saw that you had the paper that yeah. that you needed. He said he's been, uh, you know, going to do the, the Caltrans um, 
I have his uh, paperwork here. And so let me see it. He says, why is your probation officer saying that uh, that you're not going? I says, I don't know, Your Honor, <laughs> to be honest. You know, but I already, I'm already experiencing how the system is. You know what I mean? It's designed to, like, throw you in or... Yeah. I don't know if these, like, probation officers take side money to... Um, to lock people up because of these like private prisons. I, I, I had no understanding of, of this. Yeah. I just felt like I've always been given, I've been dealt bad cards a lot, you know? Yeah. The nature of the system is not to help people. It's mm-hmm. yeah. It's just to keep the system running. Right. So needless to say, I was good for a year and a half. I did all my Caltrans, mm-hmm. knocked that out. Yeah. Had an accord appearance. And he says, uh, Your Honor, I remember you telling me that if I was good in a year and a half that you'd let me go and if I did all my um, Caltrans. I don't remember saying that. Where's your lawyer? But something magical happened. My co-defendant, that original, I, I was told to stay away from him. Mm-hmm. So I haven't had any contact with him. I haven't seen him since. Um, his lawyer was there that day. Just weird. <laughs> he says, excuse me, Your Honor. I'm so-and-so's lawyer. And I'm familiar with this case. And I do remember you saying that. Oh, nice. So the, the, the judge looks at me and she says, Oh, and I told her, like, you know, I, during, during uh, the Caltrans situation, 9-11 happened. Okay? Yeah. And it, I really wanted to join the military um, during that time. I'll get into more about that, but we'll go back to the court case. And um, she's like, well, if I let you go, how do I know that you're going to join the military? Because I told her, like, I told I really, I, yeah, I, I really want to go. I told her, you know. I said, you're just going to have to trust me. You're just going to have to give me a chance. And I've always wanted to go back to her and talk to her. <laughs> yeah. You know, and tell her that I made good on it. You know, but I just felt like she did not want to let me go, you know. But I think to save face in that courtroom, she did that. Mm. You know what I mean? Or else she would have never let me go. Like to kind of show her support for the country kind of thing? Maybe. Like, uh, yeah. I hope this kid, like, goes and right. defends us. I think so. And, Interesting. Um, had I not, because I feel like every event, like, stacks and, and, and takes you to, you know, where you're going. Yeah, absolutely. You know, because it could have went a different way. I could have been more in trouble. I could have just, you know, uh, lived the rest of my life in, like, prison or dead. Yep. I don't, you know, because yep. by all rights, I could have been, you know. So, um, going back... Uh, I, I just was really tired of the life I was living. I felt like I was I wasn't going nowhere, and I didn't see any future. And I, I felt like the military was, was my answer, mm-hmm. uh, to become a better person. And I gotta say, it was this one movie that I watched uh, that happened around during nine eleven. It was called Men of Honor with uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. Uh-huh. And his drill sergeant was um, uh, Robert De Niro. Okay. And it was during a time of like segregation and racism was really high. And, um, but his personality, I felt like it was like mine because you couldn't tell him what he couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And he's going to do everything he can to get what he wants. Yeah. You know, uh, when it's in, in a positive light. You know, not and, but I've had it work for me in that way too on negative aspects. But yeah, the principle is neutral, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so it's it's however you take it, and yeah, yeah. If you're determined and you have a vision, and you can create that future, whatever it looks like. So we have yeah. to try to use our powers for good, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, I was just like, I I want to have that feeling of like doing things that are honorable. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I used to shoplift. I, I did all that stuff, you know, when I was a kid and I, 
I want to feel what it feels like to do honorable things. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I went to the Navy at first. Wait, so she, she let you off. She said, cool. So you're 20 years old or so there. I want to say somewhere between 19 and 21. I want to say 21. 20, 21. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. So she lets you out and you're like, I want to fly right. Yeah. And I'm going to do this military thing. Yeah. And you signed up for the Navy? Is that what you just said? Well, I tried, tried. to. <laughs> yeah. So I took the ASVAB and I scored pretty decently. But I guess during that time, and they they really didn't want to do the paperwork because um, my charge was a felony that was dropped down to a misdemeanor. For that incident where... Yeah, it was attempted your, robbery, on basically. Halloween. Yeah. Attempted robbery. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So they... Uh, they put it down as... Did those other guys end up getting locked up or have any kind of different... Do you know what happened I, to those guys? I don't know. I, I, I didn't talk to them after that. Yeah. You know? That's part of your deal, right? Just yeah. lose contact with them. I mean, the last time I talked to the other dude, I told him, like, dude, all your buddies, like, you know, just basically threw us under the bus. I didn't see them in the court or nothing like that. You know what I mean? And they yeah. gave up... They gave up names. Yeah. You know what I mean? Man. So... Who knows about those guys? Yeah. Right, back to back to where you're at. So right. you, you do all right in the ASVAB, but what, what happened? Yeah, so um, I was going through the motions, you know, and the Navy guys, they just didn't, they didn't want to do the paperwork on, on me to try to get me a, uh, a waiver uh-huh. because I had a... Um, the felony charge. Well, yeah, I got dropped down. Yeah, so now it's a misdemeanor. Uh-huh. Yeah, uh-huh. so yes. that, that allows me to get in. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh it was later dropped down to grand theft of persons, you know, and attempted I was just, grand? no, like, not even you attempted. You guys didn't actually take anything from him, right? No. Yeah. All right. You see that? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's a mess. That's on my record forever, mm-hmm. you know, and. Can you get it expunged after a certain point? Maybe. I think it does go away. I don't know. I don't know exactly how it works, but my understanding is after a certain amount of years for certain offenses, mm-hmm. you can do some paperwork mm-hmm. and get it expunged from the record. But I'm not sure the ins and outs of what the offenses are. But if you're interested, that might be something to look into. Yeah. So these Navy guys don't want to give you the waiver for it. Yeah, after doing all, going through the motions of doing the ASVAB and, and all that. Oh, oh, and they said that I needed to have a high school diploma. Uh, you so had, I, you I, hadn't got it at that time yet? Not the time. Not uh, at the time. Um. So I busted my butt like six months straight going to uh, uh, an adult school. And I asked them, can you give me more work? Give me more work because this work that you're giving me, I'm finishing it two weeks worth. Because I would, I would literally, I was so determined that I spent as much as time as I could. Even though they say they give you a certain amount of time. I wanted it to be to be done because I wanted to be in the military that much faster. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it took me six months because we're only allowed to give you two weeks worth of work. We can't give you three, four weeks <laughs> worth yeah. of work, you know? Yeah. And so I was upset because I wanted to, this is taking too long, man. Yeah. You know? But yeah. I ended up getting a high school diploma. It made my dad happy, you know? Hell yeah. He saw me walk, you know? I mean, it felt good. You know, because I'm, I feel like I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm making my dad proud. I'm making my myself proud, and you know, on to better things, right? Hell yeah! So how'd you end up in the army? Well, next door, usually they're pretty close. Oh to yeah, each other. they got them all right there on the block. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, the drill sergeant, oh, not drill sergeant, uh, recruiter, he was, um, he was saying. Uh, yeah, I can't for the Navy. He was like, "Well, we can't, we can't take you in, man. We're cleaning up our our act here, you know. And you got too many tattoos." Uh, so he says, "I'm gonna hook you up with this dude in the Army Reserves." So I started going through motions. He's like, "Hey, uh, what job do you want?" I was like, "Anything, man. Anything. Give me anything. <laughs> Just I'll let take me in." <laughs> yeah. He says, "You want to be a tanker? We need tankers." And I was like. What's that? What's a tanker? Oh, it's a coincidence. I I thought it was predetermined. So, I I didn't. It didn't occur to me until I you know I'm I'm kind of just reading up on you a little bit before we sit down, so I know what what to talk about. Yeah. And like I I always knew you're into like 
combat weaponry art and mm-hmm. fantasy stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, you got these pictures with these like big guns from your time in the military yeah. and, and your, your, your titles on there as uh, a tanker. Yeah. So I'm like, I thought you picked that because you got to, got to play with some big toys, but no, actually to you. that's cool. It's um kind of a funny way how I became infantry. I'll get into that in a minute, but um, that was my secondary. So I scored pretty decent in uh, on the ASVAB because if you you barely scratch by or make the minimum you know requirements, you're infantry mm-hmm. basically. Because I mean, some guys I want to be infantry, but some people get stuck with infantry because they're not scoring high enough. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, which sucks because I feel like everybody has potential. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean. Given the chance, just because you're your mathematics aren't up there at that minute because you know what? I didn't use very much mathematics becoming a tanker. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I think tests are a weird thing in any field, right? Like mm-hmm. how are you going to define my potential by what I can do in one hour in this room on this piece of paper? Yeah. Like, the human mind is so much more dynamic than what a test will allow you to, to reproduce. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I completely agree with you. <laughs> you get pigeonholed sometimes. Um, but, uh, so the the recruiter was like, well, you also got to try to cover up some of those tattoos you got, buddy. Really? Yeah, because uh, just we're not a lot we're not allowing people like that in. So I I you know I went to Homeboy Industries and I've done you know uh, you got some laser removal? laser removals. Yeah. Oh wow. I've gotten you know some cover ups and stuff like that. Um, and this is before you had your sleeves or yeah 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 okay oh yeah because for people who are listening and can't see right now you got some, oh, yeah. some pretty I've, sick looking i've had tattoos on my face oh really yeah, i didn't know that yeah, oh wow yeah but can removed. i can i uh they removed you said yeah can i ask you a, a side note okay a question about your tattoos just since it's coming up right now in conversation sure. i know you're an artist yeah. are any of uh, your tattoos uh drawings that you've made yourself uh yeah actually yeah yeah that's cool that's cool I, I, yeah uh, i got this really special gal that uh does tattoos i i won't go any, to anybody else um her name is joanna nguyen uh she operates out of um chino hills i believe or chino okay um she's very talented very few uh tattoo artists that you come across uh have some traditional art background um, a lot of people are just, uh, it's fine, but I don't prefer people who just do, um, trace tracings and, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, flash art. You know what I mean? I want, I want people who know, who have artistic, uh, abilities to, to tattoo me. Um, and especially if, if their skills are co- comparable to mine. Yeah. Because then we can speak the same language. Yeah, totally. You know? Everybody else, they'll look at you crazy and like, oh my God, this guy's telling me so much. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I can't handle it. So yeah. she's been able to reproduce your art in, yeah. in, in ink for you. Yeah, and, and also like um, add some of her touch to it to make it to make it nice. hers too. Yeah, cool, you know? cool. So it's like a collab. Oh, cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, maybe when we're done, you can you can show me if you feel comfortable. Oh, yeah. Second tattoo question. Sure. So I know you go to Thailand a bit. Do mm-hmm. you have any Sakyant tattoos? That's one thing that I need to remedy. My, okay. teach, my teacher, uh, my Muay Thai teacher has been haggling me nice, about it. Nice, nice. He's like, you got to save some room for Sakyant's, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> so for those who don't know, can you say what a Sakyant tattoo is? Okay, Sakyant, it's... Uh, I believe the origins is from Cambodia because I've seen some Sakyans and mm-hmm. it's in Cambodian. Okay. Even though it's on Thai people. Yeah. So, so the, the term itself, it's a sacred yantra, right? Like a, a yantra is a visual uh, depiction of a deity in Hindu tradition. Mm-hmm. And Southeast Asia, Thailand, Cambodia is influenced by Hinduism and Sanskrit. Mm-hmm. So you have some and of the same Buddhism, words. So yeah. Sak is related to the word sacred. No, yant- Sak no? is more of like a tattoo. Ah, the stamp, the, yeah. the print of it. Okay, right. and, and I do, but yant. I do know for sure that the yant is a yantra. Yeah, it's a visual depiction mm-hmm. of. Yeah, there's sacred text. It's a, it's a yantra, but in in Thai culture, it's it's Buddhist and. Yeah, it's it's sacred text, you know, mm-hmm. and um. Uh, they are not to be, they're only to be on the upper yep. torso of the body, not below the body. 
so it's important to say in in Thai culture, the top of the body is the most holy. You don't touch somebody's head, right? And the feet are the least holy. You don't touch sacred things with your feet. That or so that point with it goes to why you would have it above the body, right? Anything that's done on the legs is or or below the body, they have like more of um, they're in, sexual in nature. Okay, you know what I mean. But they're not um more of like uh, traditional Buddhist uh, you know uh, text and stuff like mm-hmm. that. Uh, but a lot of the wearers, they get it. It's it's like protection and, yes. and spells and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a magical element of protection to it. Yeah, and there's usually some writing and some imagery, and the imagery is often uh, an animal, like a tiger. Sometimes you'll get like Hanuman. Hanuman. Yeah, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about <laughs> Hanuman. So I've been really nerding out on this whole. I Ramayana actually have tradition. them tattooed on me too. You do? Oh yeah. man, I'm gonna I'm gonna want to see that. I'm yeah. gonna want to see that. I, I, I'm a I'm a big enthusiast and I'm doing a lot of uh, my own personal research on the many different Ramayan traditions mm-hmm. from Iran to Indonesia. That they're they're amazing. So mm-hmm. I want to get into that a little bit if we have time. Cool. Um, but yeah, so. Sakyant, man, that's that's super cool. And and what's interesting about it is you'll see Buddhist monks that are inked up with these these sacred oh, yeah. tattoos walking around Thailand. I thought that was super cool when I was there. Well, I'll tell you what, um, it's the duty of every Thai male, which I've not been able to do, but it's every duty of every Thai male to join the monkhood at least one time in their life. Yeah, for at least a little while, right? There's yeah. a word in Thai culture that means ripe. And women will call men ripe, as in ripe for marriage, uh-huh. after they serve this time. Mm. That, that's what I was I was told. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I I've been contemplating it. I've been yeah. thinking about doing it. Yeah. Well, let me tell you from experience. I spent a, uh, up like two, about two weeks at a time living in monasteries, and it's super cool. It's disciplined. Like I grew up with without a lot of discipline, mm-hmm. so I kind of crave it, and yeah. I have a hard time imposing my own discipline. But in the monastery, you know, you're waking up four four thirty. You're meditating, you're walking in a slow line to eat with all the monks, and mm-hmm. you're eating in silence and just doing it all day. And it's a, a real rigorous time schedule, as I imagine it was in the military. Yeah. So it might gravitate. So, you know, it's it's difficult. Whenever you get quiet, a lot comes up. Mm-hmm. Meditation, you know, it, it, it's tricky. But uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy it and would be happy to, to talk to you a little bit more about that at some point. Cool. But uh, yeah, I think, I, think, I think you might dig it, man. <laughs> cool. So yeah, um, back to the military. Um, it took me a while, you know, it was a struggle to get in. And then when I finally got in, I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went to Fort Knox, Kentucky. Um, that was an experience. It was... You know, I, I can handle being yelled at, you know, and it was really crazy seeing like it was almost like something straight out of a movie because some of the guys that were in there trying to kill themselves. One guy that we had drank uh, simple green and our drill sergeant was just really like bagging on him because it was like, you're an idiot. <laughs> simple green is non-toxic. <laughs> yeah, I got some stuff. I got some stuff. If you want to kill yourself and then. Um, same guy tried to jump out of a two story, you know, window. Just broke his leg. <laughs> so yeah, they they uh my oh, man. my drill sergeant poor guy. I just remember it was like, all right, you want to get out of here? Let's go talk to the wizard. That's what he. <laughs> yeah. Um, but interesting, I I went in there at twenty three. Okay. You know, I was a lot older than the guys there. Um, I sure as hell didn't run. I wasn't I wasn't a runner. You know, but I eventually was able to, during the time there, condition my body and and become what I needed to be to to graduate. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I'm, I was blown away. There's some guys that were like super buff, and they couldn't pass the sit ups. And these guys are like more physically stronger than me, so it's not about that at all. You know, you have to be strong it's and well rounded everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Um. But uh, I kind of want to cut the military thing short. Um, I had a lot of good times, you know, and, and bad times. I've lost a lot of good friends and stuff, you know. And um, it definitely helped pave my way um, in becoming the person who I am. Yeah. Um, where, did, where did you serve? Uh, I've been in, well, here, in the reserves over here. Uh-huh. And then I've gone to Guantanamo and um, different parts of um, the U.S., um, but 
it was it was definitely um it helped me develop just overall like um talking and and communicating because I wasn't a great communicator when I was younger. I still always just be quiet and yeah. not give too many answers and stuff like that. And and also um, it helped me be able to talk in, in big groups and stuff like yes. that. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it it definitely, when I first came off the airplane out of uh, uh, basic training from Kentucky and my dad came to pick me up, I just saw it in his eyes. Like, you know what, Pat... Uh, you know, I, I feel like he didn't even have to tell me like, Pat, I believe you now. Yeah. You know, I believe you're, you're trying to do good, you know? And, and the first time in my life I had like seen how proud he was be- before. I mean, yeah. besides the, sense, man. besides, feel, man? <laughs> it felt great because I, all I wanted to do was like honor him, you know, um, and, and become a better person. Yeah. And the military helped me go to school, mm-hmm. you know? So, um, what do you mean? What do you mean it helped you go to school? Did you just the, to train in your life, or did you go to school after? Uh, after. Um, okay. Well, I was in the um, the reserves when I came back, so I started like towards the end of my my uh, service. I started enrolling in the college. Okay. And I was using my um, G. What was it? What was it? GI Bill. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, that helped a li- little bit, but it's still, I'm still like behind on like student payments and stuff like that yeah my understanding is a lot of people have trouble actually accessing that gi bill money mm-hmm. Where, did you have any trouble with that it was no good. because you gotta just meet with a uh like a a veterans like representative there or something like that and they, okay. they get you all set up yeah yeah okay cool so you did a little bit of schooling did you like finish a program or did you just kind of get take some classes i graduated with a four-year degree of uh in game art and film what? design yeah. oh man i didn't i had no idea that's amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's badass dude yeah and, Hell uh, yeah congratulations uh, thank you <laughs> um actually uh i, I kind of went a little too far ahead there that's cool um yeah we yeah we can skip ahead i, I really want to get to to your documentary so okay yeah so if, if we want to jump ahead a little bit yeah uh, um, actually um my i met because me and my wife decided to go to school together, but she inspired me to take my my artistic hobby because uh, I, I had no foundation at that time. It was just raw skill. Yeah, I mi- which there was quite a bit of. Let me just say, you've always been an amazing artist since I've uh, known you. I mimicked what I saw, but I didn't understand the importance of anatomy. Ah, uh, yes, of human anatomy because it really makes a difference mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> in how your characters come out and totally. stuff. Right? Totally. Um, but I met my wife um, about a few weeks, or we started getting together like after my dad died. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Short, very short, and I feel like you know she's been such a blessing. Um, and what year was that? Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, you guys both go to college together. Yeah, because I saw her artwork. Yeah. She was already a um, a art student at. Uh, East LA College, uh-huh. and uh, I was like, "Wow, your stuff is amazing!" Yeah, yeah, she's De- good, man. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely being humble, telling her like your art is like so much better than than my stuff. You know, <laughs> I was like, "I'm so inspired by you," you know. Yeah, and I want to take my uh, my artwork more seriously. And and my dad used to always hound it into me. I was like, he used to always say, "Like Pat, I want you to go to college," you know. Um. Because nobody told me it was important when I was a kid, mm-hmm. and it's just college is not my thing, Dad. You know, yeah. but I didn't realize that I can go to college for something that I was passionate about. Yeah, <laughs> that's why. Yeah, so I'm 36 now, and I'm just about to enter my senior year. Uh-huh. So yeah, I, yeah, I had to come back around to it. Now I'm, I'm studying like contemplative practice and linguistics and mm-hmm. things that I actually find interesting. <laughs> yeah. So when you, when you realize that, Oh, I can do it my way, <laughs> it, it changes the game. Yeah. So, I mean, we both love video games, mm-hmm. you know, and we took a gamble, you know, we said, okay, maybe we can, we can do this, you know, let's go to school. Unfortunately, we didn't go to the top schools and sometimes I feel like, yeah, I, um, 
what I was learning there was was not as great as like Art Center, right? But I was all, I had already put time into it because when they when you first get there, they throw you into all these like gen ed classes, yeah. and you really don't know what you're getting into, so you're kind of already sucked in. You know what I mean? You've already put the money in or, or whatever, and you invested this time, and you feel like you know what? I, I just want to finish through. You know? Um, yes, there were some good teachers there, but there was some stuff that I I wanted to learn that they weren't providing, like environment art. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. castles, uh, painting like um, beautiful sceneries, right? And knowing this. I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to go to another school while I go to school. Yeah. I went to private art schools. Um, you know, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's because, like, I wanted to be that much better. I want, you know, because you got to think about it. Like, everybody else here that's going to school with you, yes, they're your friends, you know, but they're your competition too, mm. you know? And I needed to be, I needed to be, I'm, I'm like 30, I was 30 what? No, I was... 27 or so going to college and um I'm a lot older than these guys and I said I don't have time to play around I got to do this and I got to do this the best that, as I can yep I got to get good and I got to yeah. get good fast you know and so I paid out of my po- my pocket you know um luckily my dad when when he passed away had some savings and I used that for education and rent and whatever like yeah That's everything good use of it. yeah and um I went to to learn with this guy that worked on like, what was it, uh, Transformers, uh, Terminator Salvation, and yeah. I, I learned some like you know new tips and tricks, and it made my art really elevate, just yeah. so much faster than what I was at like school, you know. But you have to have foundation. You have to have traditional understandings of like you know, anatomy and, and perspective and things like that, because it's just going to look. And the formal schooling gave that to you. Yeah. Yeah. But even, even before that, I had a a leg up compared to a lot of the kids that were going to school there because I say kids because I was like 26 and some of these guys are just like 18. Dude, I know how it is, man. Like, like I told you, I'm going into my fourth year of my bachelor's degree at 36. Uh So a lot of the kids are straight out of high school. So, Mm -hmm. so we'll be hanging out in class and, I think my first year, everybody erupts into laughter, and I lean over to the guy next to me, like, "Hey, man, what's everybody laughing at?" And they're like, "Oh, it's a SpongeBob reference." Oh my god, dude, <laughs> I totally didn't get it. Yeah. So I'm the age of all the teachers, and I'm laughing at all the jokes that the teachers are making that the other students aren't laughing at. So yeah, I feel uh-huh. you. Man. It's a little awkward to be in that environment. Yeah, but so, you're you're not in there for them. You're in there for you, and you're, right. you made the most of it. And, and my wife too. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, she was all about the business, and honestly, like, you know. We were one of the very few uh, top uh, skilled to graduate, but yeah. it's not easy getting a job in the industry. It just really isn't, and I, I don't think I ever will. You know, mm-hmm. I've had some situations where you know I've been taken advantage of. Uh, I've worked with film directors yep. that said that. And and you know what? It's not up to them. Sometimes it's the studio because... It's a business, man. There's a lot of bureaucracy yeah. and everybody's got their hands in the pot. Right. So I did some artwork, right? Uh, pitch presentation art. But uh, it was for the same... This one company, uh, studio, I won't say who it is, but they had a movie that flopped. And we're trying to do another movie that's similar in genre. And it's like high fantasy or whatever. And they would just didn't do good. Yeah. And... Um, but the director, he, he's directed a pretty big film. I'll, I'll tell you after. I just don't like to throw names out. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, oh, yeah. Uh, when it comes to the industry. Absolutely. And he's like, yeah, you know, uh, if, um, you know, the company likes the idea, then we'll put you on for more work, paid work, you know. And then me taking chances, you know, so like, okay, let's, let's do this then because it's all or nothing, right? Mm-hmm. And they decided not to go with it. And boom, I felt like that was like my, one of the few chances that I've had to like try to get into the industry somehow, you know? Yeah. And, um, and there was a period of time where all I was doing was surviving off of like artwork that I've made into, um, uh, pinup art. Yep. 
Yeah, so you guys have this like pinup style, right? You get this like classy. Yeah, because we have a lot of like, friends. Gre- greaser style. Yeah, because uh, we have a lot of friends that are in like the burlesque uh, scene. Yeah, that's uh, you had this whole Star Wars burlesque thing going on for a while. You guys were yeah. posting about that yeah. was super cool. <laughs> yeah, and we started doing a lot of shows <clears throat> after that one. It was a big show. A lot of fans came down, and um, it it wasn't at the burlesque scene yet. Uh-huh. But there were people that came by and they said, you know, we saw your artwork and we would like to have showcase your work. And if you want to bend at our burlesque show or whatever, because I, I did pinup art because ah, a lot of women are probably not going to like hearing this, but um, I know that there's a market for, you know, scantily clad women or beautiful ladies and, yeah. and that's that's why we have like playboy magazine and but i wanted to do i wanted to do tasteful nudes mm-hmm. it wasn't porn to me you know what i mean so sex sells and you're you're selling a platform so yeah, obviously that's the word i didn't want to say it's, it's, a, it's a word, way to get into it but <laughs> yeah. you know you're you're not trying to exploit people and like you said you're trying to do it in a respectful and a tasteful way yeah so it does set you apart and there's you know, it's 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 not a pretty scene, and it is exploitive in and of itself to put that out there to some degree. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's better, you know, if you're gonna do it to do it tastefully. Yeah. And... So I would I would buy like I would get prints, uh, uh, the best like, you know, paper at the time. You know, I would go to these places and like, hey, you know, and I need your top this, you know, type of paper and not so glossy and da da da. Um, but I would charge for different size prints, you know? So yeah. like I had something that, because I believe whenever you go anywhere, most people, they want to leave with something and they don't want something that's free. They want something that they chose, you know what I mean? But not everybody wants to pay these ridiculous prices that if you go to like comic con or whatever, $20 for this little, you know, three by four image or something, you know, I had affordable prices. Most of the stuff I did was like, if I did eight and a half by 11, that was like five bucks. Oh, wow. And I would raise it by five, the bigger it gets. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So people were able to, to afford buying something from me and my wife. And we had a portfolio set up. People would flip through it. Oh, I want this one and this and that. And, And it was awesome because we were husband and wife team. Yep. Similar styles, but different. Yep. So people would choose certain pieces, you know, that that, yeah. that spoke to them. And, and, you know, she has a certain style that, you know, people like. And some people like my style, you know. So yep. there sometimes, some nights, we'd make it home. And in one night, $600. Nice. Just in a couple hours. Yeah. And you're like, that sounds like modest prices, too. Like, uh, you're real humble. Like, even on your GoFundMe and in your your documentary you're like i'm gonna set my bar at two thousand and i'm thinking shit man that's gonna like cover your ticket (laughs) and a little bit more so you know i I think that's a very modest uh goal to have yeah but when people see that your heart's in it and that you're doing it for kindness and you're giving modest prices because you want people to feel the value and get something that they feel good about Mm -hmm. people who have money end up contributing and giving more Mm -hmm. and i think you've got the heart for it and it's a business, right? So you have to figure out the business, figure out who and how is going to you're going to get ripped off mm-hmm. so you can navigate that space effectively and make the right connections and you know, you keep at it, you keep playing. Mm-hmm. People see you have the right heart and they're willing to pay hand over fist and I I feel like you, it's a rags to riches story that is like about to cross the line into the next step. I'm really excited for you. <laughs> I know in regards to my art, like some people would tell me like I should charge more, but like to be honest, like I remember what it was like to not have very much. Yeah. I still don't, I still don't have very much. Yeah. And I want to give people that chance, you know, um, to be able to get something. And if it depends, I'm a very like reasonable person. If somebody's saying like, you know, I, I can't afford this, but I really love it. And I want to get this for my kid or something like yep. that. I'll work something out. You know, I'm I'm a human being, you know, and I want to, like, I'm not a greedy person. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, uh, it's my belief and hope that people who conduct themselves like that get it paid back, you know? 
I think I believe I, in paying it forward. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like I feel like uh, I I feel like good things are going to come for you because you have this this not greedy attitude about it. Can can we talk about um, the 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 Star Wars art a little bit? Sure. Just uh, as a tangent. So we're in, we're in this middle period right now of your story. Yeah. And I want to I want to uh, to work to this documentary. Go for but, it. But uh, your girl's art. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know if there's any pending litigation that might stop us from talking about it, but she had had this rebel rebel piece. Oh yeah. And there's photos of uh, this piece before the passing of Carrie Fisher and David mm-hmm. Bowie. So mm-hmm. it's it's an old piece. Yeah. And it's a it's a photo. It says Rebel Rebel. It's got a, a picture of Princess Leia mm-hmm. with the Rebel Rebel face paint. Yeah. Of David Ziggy, Bowie. Ziggy, Ziggy, Ziggy Stardust, right? Yeah. The, the lightning stripe across the face. Yeah. So it's a mashup of, of these two things. And it's an amazing piece of art. It's on the Facebook page. You guys have your shared art. Yeah. Uh, dating, the predating uh, the passing of these figures. Yeah. Then she passes, then he passes, and the art blows up. If you Google Rebel Rebel right now, it's like the fifth picture that comes up. Yeah. But it's uh, it's... It's a, a meme page that it comes up on, not your girl's art page. Yeah. So there, I, I saw you guys talking about it, and I, I actually saw some articles about it. Like, it got ripped off. Everybody ripped off her, her thing. People were stealing her artwork. Yeah, because if you really pay attention, it's a painting. Mm-hmm. A lot of the times, like, because um, we're that, we're, we're, I don't want to say we're that good. We're decent enough to make something uh, look hyper realistic Mm -hmm. okay um damn near close to a photo but if you pay attention it's painted Mm. um so people would steal her artwork and she would have to keep on like mailing uh cease and desist letters and it's all these t-shirt companies and stuff like that like from wherever and some of them were in the u.s and we had to send them letters all the time but people you know uh high profile actors are wearing her stuff but they buy it from from her Oh, okay. You know, good, and, good. Um, you know, there's, you know, vultures out there, man. They will take your art. Like, sometimes, like, when I upload my art to um, social media, I do it at the lowest quality possible because I don't want nobody taking my stuff. Yeah. You know, and yeah, I told you, her to you do the same thing. you got to protect your product like that. Yeah, and it felt bad, you know, because, like, there were mean comments when people were, like, uh, when the art, when, when those actors... Uh, David Bow and David Bowie passed away, and and uh, Carrie Fisher passed away. People were leaving mean comments, like, you know, the artist is like a vulture, this and this and that, you know. And I would have to go in there and tell them, like, you know, what, this is my wife, and she did this artwork before they even passed. Uh, she passed away, and this damn T-shirt company is not the people who created it, and this is stolen art. Yeah, you know, and but it's really tough because it it's huge hurt what she did the artwork and it just got gets passed around left and right but most of the time it's the small uh like, version of that which she uploaded they don't okay. have the high res art that she yeah. made you know yeah that was that was incredible to to see so i'm glad to hear that like, yeah. she's so when people buy it they get the pixelated version mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. or stretched out or whatever where can we find her art it's on etsy okay. um Maybe you can post it in a link after or something like that. Yeah, it's we'll like Art a... of Leica or something yeah, like that. So it's uh, like on her Facebook, I think it was Art by Leica, but then the link was Art of Leica. Yeah. And it was the, the art of uh, Patrick and Leica Cornette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I'll have all the links in the show notes okay. uh, in the description of the show um, yeah. uh, below the episode. And we'll link to your art, to your GoFundMe, to your YouTube page, to her art. Okay. All that good stuff will be uh, just a click away. All right. For sure. Cool. All right. So so back to the story. So you guys, you finish up college. Mm-hmm. Uh, your father passes away that got you in there. So now you've got this new family unit with your wife. Oh, it's amazing. And you're part of her family now. Oh yeah. Because you know what? Like, uh, I've never really, she was born in Thailand actually. Oh wow. Leica. Yeah. Nice. She's a Thai Cambodian. Um, amazing story about her father. Actually her father, they're very humble about this, but I'm going to say it because nobody ever talks about it or, or they don't, um, there should be a story on her father for real. All right. Okay. Um, as you know, there was a like Cambodian genocide with the Khmer Rouge, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her father was like this really like top, um, I want to say like ambassador. He met with the king of Thailand and stuff like that. He was in charge of this village in Thailand called Sarin. And he would... 
he was basically the Harriet Tubman of Cambodia. He would es- he would bring people from Cambodia to save them from being murdered yeah. and brought into this little town uh, uh, in, in Sarin. Wow. And he was in charge of that town, and he took care of the people. And, and uh, like most old school like Cambodians, they know who her father is. He's actually in a book called mm. Who's Who in the World. Really? Yes. Um, it's just really awesome what he did, you know, to help help these people. He lost his whole family. What's his What's his name? Oh man. That's all something right. <laughs> I, something uh M something M for sure. I forgot. Cool, no worries. <laughs> but yeah, the, the Harry Harriet Tubman of Cambodia. That sounds that sounds amazing. Yeah. I, so you you've got this um this cultural heritage documentary that you made mm-hmm. and hearing and seeing in your eyes the passion for this other story. Mm-hmm. I got the sense that this is a something that's going to continue in your life of bringing these maybe these, these classic stories forward. I would like to talk about it, but you know um such a nightmarish time oh to, absolutely to, to be talking about that with uh my wife's family because she lost mo- pretty much all of her family i think mm-hmm. she has only one sibling left wow everybody was murdered her father had had a family they were all murdered he had kids and everything they were just killed you know it's a tragedy you know yeah that's that's really intense. But getting to know her family, they've been her mom. I love her so much. She's very sweet. You know, she's my mom's more of like a tough Thai lady. I, I almost tom, pretty much tomboyish, you know. But this is Lika's mom is like such a sweetheart, you know. And she's very polite, very soft spoken, and um, I, I love her family very much, and I would die to protect it that's we'll just yeah. keep it at that yeah i'm sure they're happy to have you as a son yeah <laughs> that's really cool i, man. I am kind of like the son that she never had her, yeah her absolutely yeah. absolutely that's beautiful i've heard it said more than once i'm not trying to toot my own horn but, you know. <laughs> no man yeah yeah that's great that's great so i want to get to the i want to talk about muay thai a little bit sure so in your documentary and on your channel you point out how it got started that you were back visiting family in Thailand mm-hmm. with an injury and you were 275 pounds and you were oh, telling yeah. them how, Oh, Hey, look at this picture of me. I used to train Muay Thai. And then they're like, Oh yeah, you had a, a, a great uncle and he, he was a famous Muay Thai fighter and he got murdered. Mm-hmm. End of story. And yeah. so then you're like, wait, what, what's more? <laughs> what, tell me more. And then so you guys, you find one picture from his funeral and that sets you off on this epic journey. Yeah. Uh, can you just, before we get into that, what, because I, so you you overcame this this difficult gang life and you joined the military and through your service you got straightened out. Actually, before I I skipped that because there's so much events that happened in my life, you know. Yeah, I know uh, we only have enough time to kind of yeah, gloss over it. I actually, <laughs> I actually, my dad to try to um, get me to get, know my culture a little bit better and and keep me off the streets a little bit. Yeah, enrolled me into Muay Thai and. Oh. Uh, in 1999, like okay. shortly after I got out of that group home, you know? Ah. And just to be better out there on the street, you know? Um, but multiple reasons. And um, that's where I met my teacher, Crew Walter. And wow. He's changed a lot, but he was a scary guy. Yeah. He was a really scary guy. Uh, but here it is this white guy, Walter, speaking Thai to me, <laughs> you know? And. I'm just blown away because, like, growing up in America, like, I really didn't have uh, too much Thai influence on me. Yeah. And it felt familiar but alien at the same time, you know. And But it felt good because I felt like, wow, you know, finally, you know, somebody uh, from a different background uh, – took interest in something from my background yeah you know and i thought that was really cool because it's something you don't really experience all the time yeah at least at least for me um so yeah i trained and up until 2003 before i went into the military i was always on and off because you know the money wasn't there and Mm -hmm. just um but um i took that with me into the military 
um, the Muay Thai culture as well as some of the discipline of the training? Uh, just more of the training aspect. Um, like I would take my teacher had a VHS at the time and um, I took it with me when I was on deployment and uh, I would watch it um, on the VCR or whatever and just, oh, okay. Let me go try that out on the bags out there. <laughs> yeah. And then I had some pads with uh, Muay Thai pads, uh, and I would have some soldiers, like, hold it sometimes or whatever so I can practice my kicks and, you know, make them feel a little pain a little bit, you know. Because <laughs> I, I, I kick pretty decent. I'm yeah. okay. I yeah. think so. Um, but it's 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 definitely an eye-opener the first time you get kicked with the pads because if you're not holding it um, uh, firmly enough, it'll smack you in your face like yeah. this. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good times. Yeah, I actually did that to my wife accidentally. Oh no! Yeah, I was like, "Oh, honey, I'm so sorry." Yeah, <laughs> so that's that's like something cool too. So I saw you started training, and then you got her involved, and she started training, and you guys both got super fit and super into it. And yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm still working on it. Um, I'm yeah, I'm definitely a lot better than what I was, but it, it's a lot of work. It, yeah, you know, um, you. I know a lot of people don't have respect for athletes. I'm not an athlete, yeah. but I know the hard work that it comes with trying to get your body. Because how do you balance everything in life and then also focus on your, your overall body? Yeah. You know, it's really hard. Yeah. And then especially in America, because life is different compared to living in a Muay Thai camp as a you know kid or, or <laughs> yeah, a fighter. Your whole life revolves around it. Right, because you eat, sleep, and, you know, poop uh, Muay Thai, you know? Yeah. Over yeah. here, you have to you have to work if you got kids, you know. And you're really lucky. So you we're here in Monrovia, mm -hmm. recording this at the Lair Studios, <laughs> <laughs> and right around the corner, down the block, you've got this world class Muay Thai studio. So we're really fortunate to have that so close by. Yeah, actually, it wasn't always there though. Um, it was in Pasadena when I when I uh, when I first started training with my teacher. He didn't even have his own gym yet. Uh -huh. And um, I'm super happy to see like how he has evolved uh since i first met him because he was out of a, a gym in pasadena called bodies in motion um and now the gym is sit sit sit, sit yod tong sit yod tong yeah and it means like students of look sit uh or look sit is like students of yod tong yeah and, and he's the founder there's a like a, oh, yeah. a bio of him on you, the website and stuff. yeah man he's a He's a, another individual training. that um, most people, a lot of people would be blown away once they find out who he is and what he's done. He's actually won the lotto and gave his money away. Oh, nice. To people, just like he, people were lining up and he would hear <laughs> their story and he'd give them what he thinks is, is uh, wow. enough. That's so cool. You don't find that in America. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You don't. And, and the culture is just different. I feel like... Um, People need to step out of their norm and, and get to know, um, especially Thai culture, because um, you can't believe that people are the way that they are, but it works. Mm -hmm. How kind they are. That's yeah. one of the first things that I noticed when I went to Thailand. So I only spent like three weeks there. You know, I did a tourist thing. I went to Chiang Mai. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, I've heard stories my whole life of people expatriating there. And I was like, oh, what, what's so great about Thailand? But I got there. And not only is the country, of course, tropical and beautiful. Right. But yeah, the people were super kind, super nice, yeah. super chill. I just felt warm and invited everywhere I went. Right. It depends on where you go, though. Like, there, there are some dangerous parts. It's, it's because, like, certain influences are, are in, like, like Pattaya is a tough town, for sure. Bangkok can be tough. Yeah. You know? Uh, but for the most part... You know, when you have the street vendors and, and businesses. The thing that Thai people understand is that people want to spend their money. You know what I mean? They're there to spend money. And if you're, if you're not open to other cultures visiting, you're not going to make any business. You're not going to, your country, you're not helping the country grow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you need to build your country up by having, because look, Thailand right now, I don't know, Thailand when my dad was starting to go was pretty much kind of like, almost like how Cambodia is now. You know, it's um, a lot of countryside. It's not very underdeveloped. Thailand is a, I would say at the time, 
it was developing, but now I feel Thailand has developed. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are moving there. People are there's a lot of jobs, job opportunities, and I, I'm questioning my uh, living status in the U.S. right now. Would you consider living there? I have, I have, but uh, you know, the fear of the unknown. Yeah, <laughs> is is what bothers me. Yeah, yeah. Every day is a, just another chance to jump off, though. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, we'll keep that in mind, of course. Uh -huh. All right, man. So, I want to get us back on track here. So, you, you're in Thailand, and you're 275. Yeah. And you have an injury. Did that injury come from the military? Or? Yeah. I, I don't want to give too much away about that because That's I don't cool. want people to use it against me if, if I ever decide to like get in the ring. And yeah. No fight. worries. No worries. Yeah. But, but um, we'll just say I couldn't walk. Uh, very yeah. good. Um, and that contributed to the weight? Yeah, and, and also, like, just going to school, too, like, being a full-time student and stuff like that, and just focusing everything you've got and yeah. trying to be better at art. Yep. Um, the video game lifestyle, just, like, eating. It's not super physical. No. <laughs> and I had a dad, yeah. I had, a, I had like, what, a Red Bull and Monster almost, like, every single day of my life. Yeah. It was weird because uh, I ended up getting a urinary tract infection. Yeah. I didn't even know that was possible from drinking all that stuff. Yeah. And so I, I thought, you know, I thought I had like a venereal disease. I mean, uh, you know, a STD or something, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, luckily <laughs> I was just like, oh God, yeah, it's <laughs> not STD all the damn times <laughs> I've fooled around, you know, in my younger days. And, yeah. You know. Came back to bite you. Yeah. No, it just turned out you needed some more water. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. So... I'm going to Thailand and, and, um, yeah, uh, it, I, I, I guess I showed them the picture because I, I was just like, I don't recognize who I am anymore. And mm -hmm. I want you guys to see me at like around my prime. Yeah. You know? And you, you were going back to Thailand periodically to, to reconnect with family and meet them. Right. I know you had told me, Hey, I met my uncle and he's got this tourist thing. If you're going out there, you hook up with him. Actually, he's my cousin. Your cousin, your cousin. Yeah. He's a really, really nice guy. Um, his name is Sue and I, uh, but you know, everybody calls him Peepin or I call him Peepin because P when you say P it's an older person, uh -huh. you know, so you would call me P Pat. Ah. Right. Um, but if we're just friends, you know, you don't really have to, you know. Um, and uh, so anyways, yeah, he's a really nice guy. He's got his own fleet. He does um, vans. He has like car, uh, I think like a Mercedes or something. He's just private rides. If you want a private exclusive like um, experience, then he'll just drive you around somewhere. And nice. he's like, I want to go to this like secret jungle yeah. waterfall area and it's like oh, okay no worries i'll nice. take you nice <laughs> yeah so you're periodically going out there to connect with the family how long like a couple weeks at a time a couple months at a time i try to go for a month nice if possible yeah you know um that's the way to do it because you know you don't see see them for very long and um i okay during 9 11 i wanted i always told myself never again because I had this weird feeling com coming over me, and uh, I told my parents, um, I want to go to Thailand. I hadn't been there in years, and I, I want to see Grandpa. And my family was like, no, 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 don't. Right now, it's not good. Everybody was in fear of traveling um, because uh, of what happened uh, during 9-11. And I think, what, a year goes by, and my grandpa dies. And I was so upset, because I I have this weird thing, like, I don't want to say it's a sixth sense, but I have this sometimes ability to guess what, something may happen, or like something drives you inside. I'm going to be bold and say it is a sixth sense and it's an intuition that everybody has. Mm -hmm. And the more that we resist it, it gets farther. And when we listen to it, it gets stronger. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've experienced. And the more I am open to it, the more clear it gets. And it makes you, it drives you kind of crazy when other people don't feel you. Yeah. Like I have to go. Yeah. Uh, 
something's driving me, it's telling me, you know, um, and sometimes like I'll say something and it ends up happening yeah. as far as like, or as far as like regarding people, you know what I mean? Like I'll, I'll, um, I'll make a, uh, guesstimation about something and, and, and then sure enough, boom, it happens, you know? Yep. Um, and, and, and it's a lot easier for me to read people too. Sometimes some people they'll see it as like, Oh, you're reading into things too much. But sometimes it's like, you've been around so many people, you start to understand behavioral. Um, I think it's twofold. It's one, it's the experience. And so you're familiar with how people are in general. So you uh-huh. can pick up on cues, Yeah. but it's also that other thing, that sixth sense, that thing that we haven't quantified in such a way that we can put it in a science book and read about it. Mm-hmm. But it's this deep feeling Right. That is more than what you can intellectually decipher is going on in the room. Right. And uh, I mean, this is a show about curiousness and that means delving into a little bit of the weirdness yeah. or things that aren't super familiar or people might think you're crazy for. Right. And that's okay. So sitting here <laughs> to me, like I believe you and I'm all about that. And yeah. I, I'm going to even take it a step further and say it's not only that we can pick up mm-hmm. on the future. We can create the future by vi- visualizing it. Anybody who achieves something amazing, we call them a visionary. Mm-hmm. What does that mean, right? You have a vision and then you achieve that vision. Not because you had a plan and you followed your plan. Mm-hmm. Yes, because of that, but also because the the effect of the present and the future is connected in ways that we haven't quite figured out. And you can you can influence the future by having thoughts and intentions Mm -hmm. is is my belief that's a bit far-fetched for some that might turn some people off listening to that but that's that's kind of where i'm at with it so i feel you man so it's kind of almost too like you will it to happen some in some some aspect absolutely it doesn't always work out but sometimes it's in the stars for you Mm -hmm. you know um so uh where did we leave off (laughs) so you you wanted you had this feeling you wanted to go see your grandpa, but you yeah. didn't travel, and then he passed away, unfortunately, right. and you were devastated. So, um, in Thai culture, you can keep the body up until like 100 days, uh, so that way people have enough time to um, get their family together and stuff like that. And I was, I was devastated, you know? And I told myself never again, whenever I get a feeling about something... I I take the right action for it, whether it's a determ like a decision or um, how I feel about a certain person. Um, I go with it because I got tired of being told no about something yeah. when I feel absolutely right about it, you know. Yeah, you have that happen enough times, you miss out on the opportunities that you knew were going to be there for you, and yeah. you, you I'm decided to take that. it into your own hands. <laughs> I'm going through that right now, and, but it's really hard because it's a different situation. We'll get to that, right. uh, but um, with the current state of things. Yeah. Um, so I eventually made my way back to Thailand, and this was, man, it was early, early 2000. It was when my dad was still alive, so... Definitely before the military, I would think. No. Maybe. Yeah, b- before the military. So it had to have been about like, I don't want to say 2001. Yeah, around there. Because definitely it was after 9-11. So um, they were just worried, you know, like for my safety because being American or whatever. But then at the same time, I had nobody to remind me that I was brown. They're not really <laughs> targeting brown people, you know what I mean? If you're an American, because during those times, if you were, you know, um, more Caucasian looking, then you could be a target for other places. But you're talking Thailand. about uh, quote unquote terrorists attacking. Right. Okay. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking difficulty traveling <laughs> from like TSA. You're no. like, oh, they're not targeting yeah. brown people. And I'm like, wait a minute. They are absolutely targeting brown people. That's where I was just like, somebody should have said, like, <laughs> Pat's not going to Saudi. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so yeah. it's, he's going to Thailand. He's, he's brown. <laughs> he's going to be all right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, stop worrying so much. And, and that's when I I told my dad too. I was like, Dad, never again, Dad. I can't. I told you I had a feeling about something. I don't know what it is, but I needed to go see Grandpa. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And I felt bad already because I didn't. 
I was actually in and out of group homes in juvenile hall when my grandma passed away mm. from my mom's side. And I wanted to remedy that. You know, I couldn't really leave the state and stuff. And it's kind of uh, shameful to tell your family, like, well, Pat's in a screwed up situation. He can't go see grandma in the deathbed right now, you know? Yeah. Because of him being an idiot. So that made it all more important for you to go see your grandfather. Yeah. I don't know. It's just one day I just, you get these like feelings, you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. And it's a drive and it tells you, you got to go, you got to do this or something. It's like a spidey sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's when I said, you know what? I'm going to try my hardest to make my own money, um, save money and try to go to Thailand every year if you can. Mm Mm-hmm. To see family, out of respect, and yep. um, reestablish a, a family connection, because for many many years, over a decade or so, I hadn't been back to Thailand. You know, just screwing around in the U.S. You know, um, doing what I was doing, and um, it. it, it, it I, I didn't even real. I didn't even think they were going to be a part of my life again after coming back to the U.S. You know, yeah. Um, but I remedied that. I made that happen because I I made it a goal to to travel back to Thailand. So you've been going periodically after you got out of the service. Yeah, pretty much. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're you're back there at that weight. You show them that picture. And then you decide you're going to start training when you get back to the States. You you do a little bit of research there. You find the pictures. You decide you want to start looking into it more. And then what what got you to like... So this is what I think people find interesting. I find it interesting. Like, what is the actual thought that gets you to shift? Be like, you know what? Today, I'm going to go to the gym (laughs) and and start. Because that first day is the hardest. (laughs) Well, you know what? It wasn't around until like 2015. Um when I started getting back into it because, um, well, before anything, I've always, I've always been intrigued by my own culture because I didn't get enough of it. Yeah. You know? And whenever like the movie, uh, kickboxer came on or, um, something, some kind of movie that involved like Thailand, some kind of way, um, it always, you know, glued me. You know, it, it it brought me, I was like, oh, wow, you know, I don't get to see much of my culture, so I, I'm really into whatever this is, you know? Yep. Uh, even the art, because when I was when I was growing up, I, I mean, even when I was a kid, I mean, I remember, like, seeing the art on the walls and, and on the temples and stuff, and I was like, wow, this is really cool, you know? And I feel like not too many people know about this stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, I remember as a kid, there was, like, um, you remember Ultraman? Oh yeah, back part. Yeah, <laughs> uh, Godzilla. <laughs> those, those type of like um, live action Japanese style esque uh, films. Yeah. Well, they had one where uh, it was like Ultraman and Hanuman in there. Uh, really? Yeah, and uh, I, I guess how, somehow these Thai people got a hold of those old Ultraman costumes or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then they decided to make their own film, nice. you know, and it's like Hanuman beating up on some like <laughs> Godzilla enemy type looking wow. creature, you know, oh, man, I can't wait to see this. And, uh, it's free on YouTube actually. Oh, you, you know, I'm going to go look it up after this. <laughs> yeah. I think it's called like uh Hanuman and the Ultraman seven or something like wow. that. Wow. And, um, and I remember, you know, and, and, and there's, there's some other films too, the same way with Hanuman. Um, but, he was my hero when I was a kid in Thailand, you know? Hanuman? Yeah. Nice. Because, you know, just the way he was, being silly and just, you know, acting like a monkey and everything, you know? But kicking butt at the same yeah, time, you know? Yeah, he's, he's the hero. Yeah. yeah he's, he's great. And uh, so there were some films. That I, I, don't, I don't know. You remember Billy Blanks? No. Okay. Uh, Thai Bo. Thai Bo? That um the exercise video yeah e- vaguely it was like cardio kickboxing yep. or whatever yeah so before that he was in a movie it was called King of Kickboxers okay and they had like they had this big fight at the end it 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 wasn't like 
a super awesome movie, but <laughs> it was in Thailand, okay. right? And this guy is like getting revenge um, because Billy Blanks killed his brother. And, uh, but at the end they had this like really, um, final fight, but they were dressed in traditional Thai, um, theater clothes. So he was like the red Hanuman monkey, the red one. I don't Uh know what the name is for that. And then, um, Billy Blanks was Tosakan, the, the main bad guy with like the, the tiered, uh, heads on the, uh, on the heads. Yeah. So, so that represents the demon from Sri Lanka from the story, Ravana? Yeah, yeah. And there so you go. As the story goes to different places, he might get a different name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. From the 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 Hindu epic uh Ramayana. So they were all decked out in, in the outfits and I was like, Holy crap, this is so cool, even though the movie's like not that great, you know? <laughs> and but I I delved into that because you don't you know, growing up in America you, you you're kind of taken away from your own culture. And I had really nobody, my mom wasn't around and it's just my dad. So I had to, you know, uh, take whatever I could in. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And definitely Kickboxer and uh, Bloodsport were like some of my favorite films, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I, I've tried to mimic drawing Thai art and I have, it's very hard. It's not as easy as one would think. I mean, they have some similar um, feel to it. Like if you look at like um, Hindu art, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And and Japanese, um, you know, uh, style art. They, they, you know, they, they look almost car- cartoonish in a sense, but the line work is so much. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I've, I've, since I've ignored so much of my culture before, I don't I don't even know if I want to say ignored. It's just that I didn't have enough of it. Yeah, you just know, wasn't around for you to right to engage with. So I mean, since the arrival of the internet, um, it's helped me like get in touch with my culture a lot more. You yeah, know? Um, just looking at all the artwork and then trying to get understanding of like you know, what some of these stories are, like, you know, Hanuman ended, ended up having a kid and stuff like that with a mermaid. And wow. it's like, I, <laughs> I mean, I don't know that, that tale. I think it would be an awesome like movie, but I feel like for Western culture, it's, it's too much for them because of the, well, you'd be surprised. So one of the things that I'm interested in is like, I don't want to go on off on this tangent too much because I want to get into your story, but so, yeah. so the, the Ramayan tradition, mm-hmm. you know, it's all from Middle East to, to Indonesia and everything in between it takes on a lot of different forms, but now it's in America and you've got all these Western devotees of Hanuman and these Hanuman traditions. Mm-hmm. There's this, this one uh, epic poem that's recited like a song called the Hanuman Chalisa. Mm-hmm. And it's in this, this Eastern Hindi dialect called Awadi, which is actually its own language, but people call it a dialect because whoever has power has the authority to call it a language. But anyway, um, <laughs> So it's this this language that all these Westerners are memorizing these forty lines mm-hmm. in this other language because of their love and devotion to Hanuman. They uh-huh. don't speak the language, but they can sing this ten minute song in a completely different language because of their love for it. So some of these things that we might see sound, think are too fantastical wouldn't translate here. People are finding tremendous value in them. Mm-hmm. So don't sell yourself short if you want to bring some of that stuff into this culture uh-huh. because. Uh, maybe some of the the strangeness will intrigue people enough to what to ask what is the deeper message here, mm. and what I think is happening now as many Americans are turning to other traditions mm-hmm. is that you know we have lost our sense of religion and morality and values, and so I know for me I've learned so much from the Ramayan just mm. in terms of the love and relationships between the characters. And I've learned how I can be a better person through the example put forth in some of these stories Uh that I had never even encountered in my own culture. Mm. So I think uh, you'd be surprised how much value there is in bringing some of these, these seemingly strange stories into the West. Yeah. And you got to remember like, you know, America's still a baby compared to a lot of those other, uh, you know, countries and dynasties. You yeah, know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and we're still coming out of the bubbling muck. Like we can't go forward in a positive direction until we look back 
at the genocide that started this country, mm -hmm. the slavery that built it, and the ongoing uh, systematic oppression of the people who still live here. So as we are coming to terms with our past, mm -hmm. making peace with that is the only way we're going to go forward in a healthy way. So I think we're still looking for the tools to do that mm -hmm. and bringing some of the, the wisdom from older traditions is helping a lot of people to do that right now. I'll tell you what, for example, and it, and it relates to Thai culture, Thailand, even Japan, you know, they knew that they needed to become part of the modernized world. They knew that they weren't going to go anywhere unless they were open to other countries and, you know, people from different ethnic backgrounds coming into their country and, and assisting however. And look where Thailand is today. You know what I mean? Um, it's so much better than what it was. And money is over there now. Mm -hmm. There are so many jobs. There's so many Westerners leaving America to get jobs in Thailand. And I'm just like, <sighs> it's just really, really tough decision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I think uh, from what you've told me about your sense of intuition, uh -huh. that when the time is right, you'll feel it. Yeah. Like, I think... So what you're doing right now is you're planning to go back and forth and do all this research. Yeah. That's, that's going to help you build the network, build connections. Mm -hmm. And if the time's right, I think you'll know. Yeah. I think you'll know. So I want to get to that. Let's let's jump let's jump right. in here. Sure. So let's, let's talk about let's, let's talk about your channel. You have a YouTube channel, Nakmoy mm -hmm. LA, mm -hmm. and your your logo is a, a graffiti logo. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's true to your roots. And so you got a few different videos on there. You review some gear. Mm -hmm. uh, the most recent one is uh, a video of you doing a round of training in 37 pound chain mail <laughs> set to yeah. a proper uh, medieval tune with yeah. a castle in the background uh, yeah. of the video. True to your artistic roots. I love it. Um, you've got a really touching video of your mom reading about uh, your great uncle who you ended up doing the documentary about. Yeah. As well as uh, you documented some fights from uh, the place you train as well as the fighters from uh, your your um, My, your gym, gym yeah. uh, going around LA at some other events. Yeah. So it's a, it's a real cool channel. I think people are going to dig it um, because you're, you're highlighting the actual stuff that's happening here. You're highlighting Thai culture and uh, Muay Thai culture. And then, like I said in the beginning, uh, it's also uh, documenting your transition and how Muay Thai is helping you. Mm. And so I think your passion and your interest in getting to know your roots really comes through. Like people who who are already masters in their field, they kind of talk about some of the stuff blasé, like, they're, like it's casual, like they assume everybody knows everything already. But you're still learning about it and really excited about that. And that comes through. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your, your channel itself, but I'd like to, to really uh, jump into this documentary. All right. Well, first, uh, just to go back real quick, um, back in 2015, I was, just, I was just tired of being hurt, and the Veterans Affairs really wasn't doing anything for me. You know what I mean? They're yep. just like, here's some painkillers and here's some, you know, some money. I'm still hurting, you know, um, but I've gotten better. Uh, since the weight loss and I wanted to reconnect with my culture too you know and and my teacher he's he's not a bad guy you know he's, some people when when they first you know look at him they're like oh he's kind of intimidating or whatever but you know what like I needed that cultural aspect everywhere you know and so I decided to go back to train and I didn't think of like making a channel or anything like that at the time it was just more focused on uh, weight loss and, but people are, you know, they, when they hear like how big I was and they, they see a picture, they're just, wow, you know, but it, it takes a lot to, to get your mind right. You know, it's, it's way more mental than it is physical. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's the same thing with the military too. You know, um, but there is a physical aspect to it, but you got to want to have it. You, it's that same like drive that I have that, you know, once I set my mind to something, something I want, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that really try to dilly dally too long. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to go and take care of it. I don't know. It's just, I, I wanted to, some people have brought it up to me before and just like, you, you should do like a video on your like weight loss journey and this and, and that. And 
Um, I still haven't done one on that. Yeah. yeah. So for those who haven't checked out the channel, you keep alluding to doing more of this, but you want to focus the channel more on the Muay Thai and the gym and the culture. Yeah. So, so... It's just, I have a lot of content, Yep. but only so much time to like, I hear you. to put it out. And also yeah. you got to remember like, um, I'm involved with my gym. I'm, I'm a corner man. Okay. So, cool. uh, so next week there's a fight, you know, and I'm more than likely going to be, uh, which I'm honored to do is to help corner the fighter, yep. you know? And, uh, and if I get a chance, film it, it's not easy to film and corner at the same time. I imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the perspective is definitely different. You're right there, like at the bottom of the ring and you're just trying to film and yeah, as to being across the room and getting the perfect shot. So know? I got to say like your style for editing is fluid and fun. The way you clip it together, like you, uh, your ability to track time. I'm really impressed by the way you clip together the fights and the music and you have it like starting and ending and in the middle. You know, what's you, funny. You I did learned... this in the documentary too. Really well. I took this, uh, I, I learned it in a day. Nice. Um, but, uh, I, I guess I, I definitely want to try to give it that California feel. It's got that. <laughs> you know? um, even like some of the filters that I put yep. in and stuff. I, I, I try to make it look like an old skate video. Yep. Um, <laughs> it's just... Maybe that's why I like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I want people come to, I want them to feel like, oh, this is West Coast. And uh, what's really cool is that I'm not only going to be filming like pro fights, I'm filming the uh even before amateur fights because we got this one guy he's rising yeah his name is mark and he's in some of the videos and and he hasn't lost a fight yet but i've done filming of his like pre-amateur fight he just had his like amateur debut recently yeah and um it's really cool because you get you get to see the journey of this this guy um getting up there yep. you know and my my gym creates champions yeah man know? and uh it, it looks it looks like a cool place online i haven't been in there in person it'd be cool to come down sometime and check it out but you're it, entitled it looks to a, you're entitled to a, um a free session i believe yeah Anybody. yeah on, on there i think they get you get like a free week of training or something when you sign up i or think a free so session or a free there's there's some kind of trial intro, class introductory trial class. deal there yeah 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 yeah, it's it's it seems like a like a top notch spot. It is, and it's a va a very famous camp in Thailand. And as you know, I I I kind of like brought up a little bit of our uh, grandmaster, what he's done, and um, he's like one of the most well known like um, Muay Thai uh, coaches and trainers out there. Yeah, there's a nice biography or brief, but, yeah, but nice biography. He's a very special guy. On the website. A very special yeah. guy. He is. Um, so yeah, I decided to make this channel and. Um, I wasn't gonna delve right into my grandmother's brother's story just yet, but you know, I um, it's one of those sixth sense, like I said, you know. Um, well, since my job let like ninety percent of its uh, workforce go, uh, including myself, maybe this is a push for me to do the story. But I feel like there's there's so much more to it. Yeah. I only have like a portion of the story. So this is like um draft 1. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and that's what I'm so impressed by. So so this documentary, uh your great uncle Sakchai Nakpayak. Uh-huh. So in this documentary, you talk about it's it's a little bit autobiographical biographical in how you talk about how you came to make it, but yeah. it focuses on his story. Mm -hmm. And I just I just want to compliment you and how you presented it because it seems like there's clear cut scenes throughout it. So it keeps it moving along very well. You know, we're, we're kind of having a very casual long winded conversation now, but your, your narration in the film is tight and it's to the point. Mm -hmm. And what I was really impressed by is how you took these old fight details and narrated actual fights with them. So you've got the sound of the crowd in the background and you're narrating blow by blow and the yeah. knockdowns and, and you've got these these recorded details, and you make it feel like the fight is alive. It's from the 1950s, for Christ's sake! But <laughs> yeah. it, it, I feel like I'm in the ring, yeah. and and that's due to your narration with the the punches, and the kicks, and I yeah, I was captivated the whole time listening to it. And I listened to it again this morning mm -hmm. in preparing for a conversation as I was getting ready. But I just listened to the audio as it played, mm -hmm. and even the audio without 
looking at the the, the amazing uh, footage you put together was was enough to keep me wrapped. So I I know we were kind of casually talking about maybe uh, you putting out a podcast, and I think what you're doing is already sufficient for that audio if you didn't include the video, mm-hmm. which for podcasts uh, some people do include video. Mm-hmm. But I absolutely loved it, man. Uh, your narration is spot on. Your fights are good, and I just I, I'm really excited to to see how other people are going to react to it. Well, you know, the thing is, it's, it's, it's really a little gem of Thai history because, um, most of like, like I said, I think earlier in our conversation, um, everything was like word of mouth back then. So yeah. you don't know, like, well, it's just a legend. And then, and then also you have like that, uh, effect where you hear one story and then and it changes when yeah. it comes back around to you or yeah. whatever you know. But this is very rare doc, and and I just started out with the photo, man. Yeah. So uh, yeah, let's tell that story. You you started out with the photo. Yeah. And what happened? And so, you know, I I wrote down the name how they pronounce it in Thai and, um. Yeah, it's just really tough because I was like, okay, where do I go from here? I, you know. They didn't say how famous he really was. I mean, this is like finding out, like, let's say Muhammad Ali, for for instance, right? Like, a hundred years from now, and he was just casually forgotten about, yeah. right? And then you find out you're related to him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And then, like, uh, the the information is scarce. You don't know where to look. You don't know how to find it. And your your searches aren't very good, right? Yeah. So with my grandmother's brother, um, so I Googled his name. Uh, and as you know, on the documentary, this one like uh, forum came up and it was like an old Muay Thai forum and somebody scanned some pages from a book. Um, and uh, yeah, there he was. I was like, I saw, I recognized him right away. And he was like dead center, obviously, like n- top fighters of 1950 or something like that, right? 1950s. And uh I was like, that's him, Un- you know, undeniably. And I was like, wow, that's so cool. I found him. And I didn't realize he was in a book, you know? Yeah. But that's where curiosity takes you, you know? You just you just got to just try, right? Yeah. And so I was like, oh, man. Uh, oh, I hope this isn't it, it you know? I, if he's in a book and they're saying he's, like, one of the top fighters of the 1950s, there's got to be something more out there. Yeah. Right? So there's this... um female fighter that i follow i i really love her attitude her name is sylvie von douglas um she's known to be the uh first uh foreigner to have like over 100 fights in thailand oh wow yeah she's like on fight 250 something or whatever and she's high in there right now she's still fighting yeah oh cool and she's super humble she's like exactly how i would want like people to view americans you <laughs> yeah. know what i mean yeah we we not have the idiot- made quite the name for ourselves around the yeah, world <laughs> not the idiots that we can be sometimes you know what i mean yeah like acting stupid and making us look bad in other countries you know? yeah but she's super humble she's like a really sweet like person and that seems to go with the practice right so i know like when i think kickboxing i'm like oh it's just a bunch of grunts hitting each other and you're like mm. okay it's tie kickboxing you get to use knees oh okay uh-huh. elbows and so i'm like okay it's this this violent thing barbarians and yeah monsters <laughs> yeah i don't want to hit anybody i don't want to get hit i don't even want to see that yeah you know but then i you know you start looking into it and you're like oh it's extremely like uh respectful and humble there uh on your on your facebook page you posted uh this clip about this guy talking about jai yen mm-hmm. cool heart yeah and how they will deduct points in a fight for fighting angry. Yeah. You got to keep your cool, right? Like, so it's it's a mental game. It's uh, about respect and being humble, yeah. and that's so much more important than how hard you hit somebody. Well, another thing too is like you know we're very big on losing face. Yeah. You know? um, but ever since I was a little kid, you're I'm always I was always taught to respect your elders. Um, whenever somebody comes in that's older to the house, you know, and mm-hmm. they, they tell you, they tell you right away, what the, you know, that means like your auntie is a little bit older or whatever. Right. And you do it, you know, and you're just like taught that way from being a kid, you know? 
I mean, it's not to say that, you know, Thai people can't be violent because they can be. They, you of know course. what I mean? But, people um, are people. Yeah, but in the Muay Thai culture, respect is everything. Honor is everything. Respect to your teacher, your school, your family, uh, whatever deity or God that you believe in or whatever, you know, it's all about respect. To be honest, you see these guys like banging it out in the ring and just like totally like hardcore, you know, but some of these guys you meet outside the ring, they're like some of the sweetest, shyest people you'll ever meet. Yeah. They'll be like, no, yeah. no, no, I can't, I cannot, no, no. Yeah. You know, just very shy and timid, some people, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the ring, they can be total killers. I think, you know, you hear uh, fighters talk about that all the time. Like, if you have the ability uh-huh. to be strong, you're confident, and so you're not walking around in fear. So you don't got to flex. You don't got to look tough out on the street because yeah. you know you're tough inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you, yeah, so a lot of the, the toughest guys are actually really nice and gentle. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's, that's beautiful to see. Yeah, and I think in terms of, like, uh, martial arts in general, there's usually this... Uh, profundity that exists uh, in how the cultures are respectful and from the outside it always seems so violent mm-hmm. but from the inside it's it's really about discipline and honor and respect oh you gotta think about too the like the Y crew is the the warrior dance that they do before the fight oh, you know, I don't know and and uh, it's much and that's one thing that kind of upsets me a little bit sometimes when I go to these like kickboxing events and stuff is because like us as Americans, um, we're very closed off to other cultures and they don't want to see that beautiful Y crew because mm-hmm. the Y crew actually means like, uh, Y like paying, paying your specs with the praying hands mm-hmm. crew means teacher. Oh, so okay. you're respecting your teacher. Yeah. And every camp, in Thailand, that has their own Y crew is very. It's very different. They're not all the same. And yeah. and if you're a person, if you're an avid like watcher of like Muay Thai fights, you can be good enough to find out where they're fighting from based on their Y crew. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, that's cool. And it's not all about the violence. No. And the the awesome thing about the Y crew is that it helps the fighter get warmed up and um, the blood circulation going before the fight. It helps them relax. You know what I mean? And I feel like it's a critical part and it's part part of the culture. And I feel like as Americans, that's why we have MMA too. Like MMA is basically taking everything that they want and throwing everything away. You know, the cultural aspect. Yep. You know and. Um, I I understand that having a white crew for every single match is definitely going to make a, a a fight carry on like very long. How long do they take? Uh, there's usually five rounds, so um, five rounds, five minutes. Sometimes it depends on the uh, if it's amateur. I think it's like three minutes. But they do. The, how long does the the white crew take? Or three, five minutes. No, I mean, uh, well, the white crew can take up to two, three to five minutes, depending on the, the school. Okay. Well, yeah, I think it's like three, five minute rounds for, yeah. Um, so it can add right like now. an extra half hour, 45 minutes to the whole event. Yeah, I mean. Which a three hour event is already, is going to make it <laughs> yeah. that much longer. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I understand that aspect, but they should allow each fighter to like, um, and they also seal the ring. They walk around and they hold uh, the hand on the, the rope and then they uh, kind of like do a little like um, motion uh, or a prayer at each corner. And it's to remove, it's a spiritual thing. Yeah. To, to remove all the negativity in that ring or whatever is left over or just some people think it's bad spirits or, or whatever, yep. you know, it just depends on what you believe. So Thai culture is really interesting. So I learned a little bit when I was there. So it's a fusion, right? Uh, so the, the, before Buddhism and Hinduism entered, there was animism. And so the temples are in this animist form and you have a Buddha inside and a Hanuman outside guarding it. <laughs> so it's like this really interesting fusion of traditions and they didn't do away with one or the other in the West. Nowadays, we think we have to have, clear delineated lines either you're this religion or that religion yeah but throughout history it wasn't so clear and you could, were, you could mix it really easily and it wasn't a big deal it's very reminiscent of like what natives uh did is like 
like um believe in like um spirits of the forest and yeah nature nature spirits it's kind of the the root of most or many world religions i've actually just started delving into that recently actually um you know there's some pottery and stuff like up north um that they found there's like an excavation site or something like that and like they found some like early pottery and stuff like that uh it's pretty cool yeah, I didn't, yeah. Even, I didn't even know that. I'm super interested in history and archaeology and like the anthropology of religion and how it's moved throughout mm-hmm. Asia and Southeast Asia. It said that uh, the original settlers were actually African. Wow. If there's actually a, a tribe right now in, in Thailand, I believe somewhere up north, um, you can tell that they're definitely half like African and half Asian. This This mix that you can tell that they're like the last surviving like tribe mm. of like original because eventually because if you look at thai people you got like dark people like me uh you have your very light like almost like chinese looking because th- there's influences from mongolia india mm. africa um and so that's why you, you see many different color the, but of thai people but they're all thai yeah but even one, your great uncle, you said in the film, his father was Chinese. Yeah, uh, definitely. But my my mom's father, um, super dark, mm-hmm. super dark. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and then there's a lot of uh, what they call hill tribes mm-hmm. in Thailand. People who aren't part of the the main Thai population, they stay somewhat isolated. Yeah, and preserve their culture and. Right. So, like right now, I mean thing that's going on in thailand is uh you know it's a lot of the media kind of messed up um sorry to stray away from the conversation but like you know fairer skin is like the you know ideal because of western yeah. culture and stuff like yeah. that you know? throughout my travels in thailand i'm always surprised like you can't get like a a skin lotion that, that doesn't have a whitener in it <laughs> yeah bleach. Like, come on yeah, man some like skin bleach you're kidding me whereas here in america we're like uh can we go to the tanning booth again today <laughs> like yeah. everybody wants to be darker so i mean i think it's a case of the grass is greener yeah but i mean we also do have decades of western and american influence telling the world that this is the best way to be so it's it's psychological warfare that has played out and now you have you know people modifying their bodies to look what how they think beauty should be yeah when really diversity is amazing and everybody's beautiful but right yeah it's a trip man so yeah let's get back to uh yeah so trying to find out I, i messaged sylvie and um because uh, she trains with right now she's do, doing what, what she's doing right now is pretty awesome she's trying to preserve like um some of the teachings and and videos of these last remaining like um muay thai masters dude that like everybody like idolized because like i think it was like 80s and 90s it was kind of cons- what they consider the golden age of muay thai you know okay and it was super awesome well you had like you said all those movies were coming out yeah <laughs> kickboxing yeah movies people and... were starting to like uh get a feeling for what is muay thai uh... this stuff is brutal like when it first came on the scene like all those old school like martial arts dudes they did not like it mm-hmm. they called it dirty fighting but you got to remember like muay thai is like um an ancient art thousands yeah. of years that fought you had to fight uh without weapons you had muay thai to like defend yourself against invading armies you know farmers yeah you know like you know what are you gonna do what are you gonna do if you drop your weapon you know what i mean so like uh you'd have all these early like kickboxing matches and and they you know they they'd water down some of the tie fighters rules so that way they couldn't use their elbows they couldn't use their knees you know and i'm gonna get into the video about that like i'm not, i'm not about trash talking but i am about talking the truth yeah about what happened you know what i mean mm-hmm. and what's out there uh so you know sylvie i you, so she, you said you said in the video like you you didn't know really know where to go and you you saw her and you she seemed like a nice person so you reached out to her yeah and she, she is. sent you a bunch of pictures from a book she had yeah and i was like oh man that's super awesome like where'd you get this book and um a lot of it was in thai you know but uh a lot of the important stuff like that said who he was and stuff like that was in English. Nice. And, um, 
you know, when I first talked to her, she was like, I was like, is that, is that it? You know, is there anybody else you might be able to point me in the right direction and know about him? She's, she's like, maybe one guy that kind of like teaches uh, Muay Thai for free on the weekends at Lumpany Park. And, uh, but he might, all you're going to probably get, don't be surprised. Don't feel bad if, if all he says is, oh yeah, he was a good fighter. And that's it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So... I was like, okay. My wife ended up buying that book for me. And, uh, you know, it was super awesome. She had to order it from Thailand. And, and it was to have something physical like that. You know what I mean? It was, like, very touching. And um, I felt a lot more closer. But Was it motivating also to keep... Yeah, to keep digging, you know, because I was like, okay, come on now. You know, he's in, a, he's in two books now. <laughs> you know, like... Why is there hardly anything about him? You know, I, I, I knew that much that he was murdered, you know. And um, so I decided to go back to the forum and I looked and I found the the person who scanned it uh, mentioned where he got it from. Uh, uh, it was from a convention in China, a Muay Thai convention in China. And this is the author of the book, Alex Su, right? You know, me just being curious and just wanting to go and dig some more. I was like, oh, wait, found, I found him. You know, I looked him up on, on Facebook and I messaged him. And, and the only way I knew it was him was because, like, some of the pages that were scanned had this, like, statue of this, like, um, I think it's Nikon Om Tom. It's a famous Muay Thai fighter that fought off, like, 10 Burmese soldiers. It's another oh. awesome story. The Thai people are very proud people. And um, that definitely you know, um, makes a lot of Thai people proud because he, he won his freedom by defeating all those. Oh, uh, wow. He was a prisoner of war. Yeah. Um, so is this man, the, the Chinese Muay Thai scholar that you mentioned in the documentary? That yeah. He's a to? historian and author. And he's, uh, he's part of this, um, uh, he, he's been on like the Muay Thai council and stuff like that. He's a very important guy, you know, and, but from China and I'm still tripping out like how this guy, Alex, uh, is able i mean it's not just on my uncle yeah he's got stuff on other fighters oh, you know I'm sure. and um he's made it his whole life's work you know and That's amazing. i wouldn't have this story without him you know and it's a hell of a story so you uncovered quite a bit i don't know how much of it was through him but you narrate uh your uncle's life yeah. And you tell about, uh, you know, there's some recorded details of his personality. You know, he, he fought in and out of the ring, but he was also quiet and humble and shy. Yeah. The is... ladies loved him, but he was a one woman man. Yeah. Uh, yeah, man, you, you uncovered a lot of details and you, you, you painted a really beautiful story in your documentary. Yeah, actually it was, he has like a bunch of, Alex sent me like a bunch of, um, newspaper articles and then, and then also like, um, oh, wow. things, people that wrote about him during the 1950s, you know, oh. and people always, he was in magazines and just like some people were just like, yeah, don't forget. It's kind of like, don't forget about, or here, Hey, remember this is something may have came out in like 1970 or whatever, but it talks about like sock chai or whatever in this like small like column or something like that. So he sent me everything that he had, all the newspapers that came out during the time when he got murdered and stuff like that. Um, it seems that sock chai is like his, one of his favorite like fighters. Well, it's he, an amazing story. Well, from what I understand, he's like, he was contender for greatest Muay Thai fighter of all time. And then he got murdered in yeah. his prime. Yeah. And and I guess you know we have the story, but there's also some mystery surrounding his death. It's crazy. So it's an it's an amazing legend. No wonder there's a lot of intrigue around it, and that's why I think uh, it's so exciting that you're you're drawing this out and presenting it in such a palatable way for people to take in. Yeah, it's really I don't want, entertaining. Yeah, I don't want to like entertain too much of the um, theories because uh -huh. Thailand can be dangerous, man. Yeah, you know what I mean, and. Um, you can't go going around asking too many questions and stuff, you know, okay. you got to be careful. And, uh, just during those days, like it was, it was gangster, man. Yeah. 1950s Thailand was gangster, dude. Like they didn't, they didn't shoot you. They stabbed you to death, man. There's a movie out there, uh, that I watched on a, on a flight to Thailand, actually. And I thought it was kind of cool. It was, um, it's called Antapal, but released in the U S it's called the gangster. Uh. And it's about 1950s Thailand. Wow. And um, 
they called it the age of knives transitioning into the age of guns and um the only guns that they had at the t time were, were like zip shooters or whatever just like one shot or whatever you know that they made out of a pipe or something but um yeah the, the thai dudes walking around with like pompadours and looking like elvis and stuff it was it was, it was definitely it, revisiting it it kind of made remi made me um visualize a little bit like how life was like for my uncle you yeah. know and it wasn't very common I mean, it wasn't uncommon that you know muay thai fighters or whatever would just get into like some street stuff street beef you know yeah. getting stabbed to death or whatever um or other gyms some gyms were like straight up like crews of gangsters wow in thailand yeah that makes sense but your uncle, your great uncle, he his story wasn't that. He wasn't just causing some trouble on the street. No. He was defending his lady. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought that was that was really powerful. That was that that moment that you narrated. I was yeah. Just like, Damn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was tough because I'm still. Uh, she may be alive. Yeah, that's what that's what you said when we started talking. You got some new information. She may be alive, and you found out she was she had a kid pregnant. Three months, Three months when he died. Past. When he died, yeah. Yeah. So you accumulated a bunch of information and you put together this documentary all on your own? Yeah. All on your own. Yeah. You got awesome music behind it. Your narration is spot on. Without it's the, tight. yeah, the music, you know, that was an outside source and stuff like that, but it mm -hmm. helped. But pretty much putting the video together and um, getting the translations through my mom and uh, my wife's sister. So, yeah, I didn't do it entirely on my own, but making the video, yeah, like I needed those elements from other people. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. So you've got this GoFundMe page. Yeah. Um, and you're trying to raise some more money because there you've got a few more leads. You got some connections in Thailand. You know there's some some clear cut places you need to go. Yeah. Um you were laid off from work, so you've got some time to do it right now, but you don't have the money to do it. Yeah. So I mean, I have money uh, that might last a little while longer because I'm, I'm right now like um, I'm trying to diligently find a job. Um, but if I had some help, I might be able to just go because what's what's a couple of weeks? You know, what I mean, for for help, you know, um, whatever donations I can get, because I, I can be applying for a job all this time and I probably won't even get a job until like four months from now. I don't know. I've been out of work before. I've, you know, yeah, that's, and, and it that's sucks, how that goes. you know, yeah, I hear you, but if I can go now fresh, um, and still apply for jobs while I'm overseas or whatever, at least I can still be like, um, doing something positive and, and contributing more to the story, you know? Uh, Absolutely. And there's, there's a lot, I mean, regardless, there is his, fight robe over there yep. and and they're not just going to give it to anybody i'm the only one that's doing muay thai in the family right now and um i feel it's a good way to honor to be an honor to like meet them not just like take the stuff you know mm -hmm. or have somebody go and pick it up and just take it like some thieves or something you know like, i, I want to go and meet these people and pay respects um and then do some investigating of where the gym was because uh, from what i understand the the gym closed down a long time ago uh not payak gym and um i still need to figure out if it was in rayong or in bangkok i have to talk to like old school dudes i mean supposedly there were some fighters that a couple fighters that fought under that gym name i have to talk to alex again you know to find out if he knows like who these people are so that way we can like track them down yeah um, the daughter of Sakchai. Yeah, you know? she's out there somewhere. Yeah, but that's what it says in the newspaper. But we need, you know, we need to find yeah. out if that's legit or not. You know, but um, you know, I gotta like it feels weird. I know what I'm doing, and other people were hearing this story. But I feel like some of my family members they, I don't know if they feel like how important it is. Uh. Mm that the story is being told because to to them so oh you know grandma's brother was a muay thai champion that was it he was murdered you know 
but they don't realize that I, I feel like some of them don't realize how important it is to other people that we have this history, this story, because what Sylvie's doing right now is preserving what these masters have done, you know, before they go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or the, the knowledge that they have to share before it's lost forever. And we've already lost a lot of like techniques and, and masters and stuff like that. But what I have with my grand uncle is very rare, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, and I feel like it's a, it's a treasure for Muay Thai culture. You know? Yeah, absolutely. I personally am not very interested in Muay Thai mm -hmm. and your story is a treasure for me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I love a good story. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter like what it's about necessarily. If it's a good story and it's got emotion and you're connected to the characters, because it doesn't matter what we're doing. We, we, like we said in the beginning, we share the same human values. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I not very interested in Muay Thai, but your story, your personal story and the story of your grand uncle mm -hmm. had me just captivated the whole time. So I think culturally it's important in and out of Muay Thai circles. Mm -hmm. And and I feel it's important too because I feel like um, we're losing a lot of our ourselves um, getting in, in more into the modern age. Yes. You know? I agree. Um, but there are still people who, who practice the traditional arts of like mask making and uh, the traditional dancing and stuff like that. You know, it's that is definitely preserving the culture. But imagine if you could find out who was the first person who designed that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like, that's part of history. You know, yeah. it's like this person actually came up with how this looked. And this is the person, the art style that we, you know, the person who created it is so-and-so or whatever. Maybe they have that information, but may what if they never did have that information? You know, it's just the more things that you can put into history, you know, um, it's just, I feel it's better to know where you come from and, and just more information about it, not just something lost to history. Yeah, absolutely. You it know? makes it makes the understanding of it and the appreciation of it that much more rich mm -hmm. and colorful. And I think sometimes having more details inspires people to get more into it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if you wouldn't have, if, if your uh, family would have just said, oh yeah, you had a an uncle who did that, you'd have been cool. You'd have been like, cool. But when you saw that picture, then you're like, bam, I got somewhere to go with it now. So yeah. having, having a little bit can go a really long way. So the yeah. work you're doing, it's, you know, you're getting your foot in the door, but it's, you know, it's opening it up. Like it's, it's getting me interested in Muay Thai. <laughs> Sometimes it's, uh, I feel like I'm chasing a ghost, you know, mm. and um, it's just really tough, you know, it's like, cause I don't, I don't know where it's going to lead to, but um, even with the story that I have now, it's it's cool, but I know that there's more. There's, yeah. I mean, I still have this a little bit that I know that I still need to gather, you know? Yeah. Um, because if I do find the other students, I can preserve the Y crew. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. You yeah. You know what I mean? Because if I can see what the Y crew looked like, I'm saving that. That's like, yeah, the the way you, you explained it, it's like this this prayer and this homage to the teacher and to the lineage. And, yeah. Yeah, that seems like a powerful component. I'm, I'm glad that that's, that's something you're I don't want it, to do. I don't want it to be lost to, like, history. You yeah. Know? Even if it's some old man trying to recreate it, at least I can try to mimic it, you know, what, what it looked like. Because I'm pretty sure if they're in their prime, you know, it looks so beautiful. But who knows? It might meet an old 80-year-old guy that knows how to do it beautifully. That'd be super cool. You know? Yeah. So I think your cultural preservation work is what excites me the most about it. I'm, I'm curious to know what you're going to dig up. So people can check out your documentary on your YouTube page. Yes. Nakmoy LA. Yeah. N -A -K but they have to go. A Y L A. Yeah. yeah. M U A Y L A. Yeah. Nakmoy. And we'll link to it in the show notes. Like I said, people can check out the documentary mm -hmm. 30 minutes on there. Yeah. And then they can go if they want to your GoFundMe page. So right. I definitely want people to watch it and to share it if they like it. And if they want to contribute 
they can do so on your GoFundMe page, mm -hmm. which uh, you you say in the video you you're happy to give people uh, credit where credits due and, yeah. and and make them part of this project. Yeah, and that money is going to go to funding your future studies and getting these artifacts put in museums and going towards a proper preservation of this culture. Yeah, because the thing is, like, not everybody's going to give up information freely either. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I got to be prepared for that too. Um, if they're going to say, oh, you know, give me 500 baht, you know, and I'll tell you where, you know, uh, Nakpayak Gym used to be. Yeah. I'm not going to turn that down. Yeah, so th that was another thing about Thailand. So when I was there, uh, mm -hmm. all the tourists I was with, they were like, oh, yeah, no problem anywhere, except I got pulled over by the cops today, and I didn't have an international license, so they shook me down for half the money in my wallet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, apparently that's one of the things that people do in Thailand. They'll ask you for money to yeah. to get by, so that might be part of, part of your adventure. It is, and honestly, like, the reason why, and I'm being humble about it because... I feel like 2000 is, is, is not very much, but I also have family to help me. Yeah. So, I mean, I could, like I said, I mean, I, you know, I'm a straight shooter, you know, appearances. I don't want people to judge me on the way I look and, and I know about my past history and stuff like that, but that's not who I am anymore, you know, and I believe in being honest and good and, and, um, being a straight shooter. So I have family that can help me. I have my cousin that's a tourist and I want to be able to pay him. I know, you know, he probably might, you know, give me a discount or whatever like that. So I factor that in, into that, uh, spending as well. And, uh, and I just know I don't, I don't need to stay in some like five star hotel. You know what I mean? I can stay in like yep. a little shack or, or whatever in a mosquito net you know, yeah. and, and, yeah. and budget my money so that way I can find it. And, and honestly, if I don't, uh, I'm going to have like a small portion of my personal money that I'll, I'll try my best to like use. And then, um, whatever I don't use for, um, what's been donated, I would want to try to like disperse it back evenly to everybody else. Like, so whether they get $5 back or, or whatever it is, because I'm only dedicating that, uh, 2000 towards like whatever i do for the trip and film yeah you know what i mean well remember it's an ongoing effort so even when you come back with this information yeah you can need time to put it together and if you do end up putting a proper full-length documentary yeah. together that's gonna require resources as well as distribution and all the things that come along with that so have the long-term strategy about that money yeah too. <laughs> well actually the way the way the um the next film is gonna be is going to be more, uh, my vision is narrated by Sakchai. So you're hearing the story and like maybe somebody's like typical Thai accent. And, yeah. You know, um, <laughs> I was born in Chonburi or, or whatever, you know what I mean? But like, that's how it's going to be. Yeah. That'd be cool. That's how I want to do it. And I want to do this like, you know, maybe from the history channel or something similar that like how I remember the history channel, like some, some <laughs> kind of special, you know, Before they went off on the alien tip. <laughs> yeah. Cause like my, my journey of discovery that's done, you know what I mean? It, it, the more important story is, um, the story of sock chai, you know what I mean? Um, and then maybe after the documentary, like on some kind of DVD, it's like, a special feature where it talks about my discovery or whatever, you know, and, and, and what we're doing here kind of like, uh, going into like how the whole story came about, how it was found out and stuff like that. And like special features or something like that. And it'll be a, it'll be on a disc. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I want to make a movie and me and Alex are talking about it. I, I, I didn't even bring it up. You know, it was more Alex, uh, that kind of s suggested it. He said it would be a great movie, you know, to talk about because there's a lot of Muay Thai movies out there, but none, I don't think, would be as great as this. I mean, you have your, you know, kickboxer. Like, I want to be your student, and yeah, so they're sensational. That's typical Karate Kid stuff. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And um, I mean, this is this is an epic story of of love and loss, of coming up in the ranks, of rags to riches. Like it's got yeah. all the elements of the human condition that people love to hear about It'd be a without great... having to over sensationalize any of it because mm -hmm. it's all amazing as it is. And there's no, I, like I've seen some like Muay Thai movies, you know, and 
I mean, Thai people love action, but I feel like they're also very patriotic. And they love anything to do with, like, Thai culture. Like, whenever you watch something where it's from a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago, um, you know, in, in the ancient land or ancient capital of Ayutthaya, you know, and, and how it got destroyed by the Burmese or whatever, Thai people are very into those movies. And, and I've seen those movies. Like, yeah, um, there's a movie called The Legend of uh, Suryo Thai. It's this princess or queen uh, in Thailand and it was beautifully done um, and they're getting really good with the movie making out there I remember when it was just like eh, <laughs> and it's starting to look kind of like Hindi like filming uh, you know that graininess that that I kind of have with my, my yeah. videos you yeah. know um, it's got a real nice analog feel to it <laughs> yeah so um, Texture. And, it's, and it's almost like some of it's almost like a homemade video or something like that yeah. you know but no, they're getting really top notch out there in their movie making, especially with with uh, this movie called Ong Bak. That really helped, like, um, bring a, a peak in, peak in interest in Muay Thai ah. because uh, they see him and they're like, he's like the the new, he's like the Thai Jackie Chan, like. Oh man, the stunts that he was doing in that movie is just and and the, the Muay Thai um, stuff that he was doing. Not everybody can even achieve that, but he's an actor. But he, he's super badass. And Jackie Chan. And also features um, Kru Yo Tong Senanan, uh, our our grandmaster in that movie. Oh wow! Yeah, bringing it all together. Yeah, <laughs> tying so, it all up. You know, That's so cool. so it was a really big um, part of like Muay Thai. It, it helped us like get you know more influence and and, yeah. and interest. You know, so yeah, I, I think it would be cool to make a movie. But if we if we can do it in the style of like, it's almost like a documentary or, or, um, you know, a narration of his life and, and just, you know, happenings. And, and I want to, I want to get more of the, the Sunni and Sakchai story. Yeah. You know, I want to know yeah. where they met. That's why I want to like go and try to find her, you know? And, and, and if she's passed, if, did she ever talk about Sakchai? Anything, anybody can remember like to help move this story go forward you know because i honestly i want it to be a love story you know what i mean yeah uh i think everybody enjoys a good love story you know but yeah. it's a tragic ending but um i think it's it, it was a cute time and dangerous time you know but just the how he dressed and how it's I classic all of it. You, you know, <laughs> I, I I was lucky to find that video. It was actually Thai people in the 1950s dancing. That the dancing they, video, yeah, yeah. And and the only way you could really tell they were like Thai people is like there was like some um, waiters and they had some traditional um, Thai uh, like sarongs that they were uh. wearing with like a with a, a sports coat on top. <laughs> but you could see there were bare feet. Yeah, walking around, um, you know, with trays and stuff. Wow. And so that really like. I was like, wow, you know, because it brings me, it brings me into how it was back then, you know, and, and I wanted to share that with um, the viewers, you know. Totally. Yeah, I thought you did a good job. I felt I was immersed through the music and the, the old timey footage and your narration. Yeah, I, I was immersed in the world and I'm, I'm really hoping to get the chance to watch a full length documentary about it. So before we, we wrap up about uh, your uncle and your documentary and your channel. Is there anything else you want people to know about uh, your your channel, the documentary, how they can get in touch with you, and um, and what you you want to get for contributions? If you need any other help besides money, I know somebody's going to be helping you to do the like you want to put your narration into Thai so the Thai people can enjoy can, it. can enjoy it properly. Yeah. Yeah, so is there any sure. other any other call to action you'd like to ask for, or anything else you want people to know about uh, what, what you got going on right now? I mean, if you want to, anybody wants to reach out, you know, ask questions. I'm, I'm very open. I'm having a hard time trying to get in contact with the um, uh, World Muay Thai Council. Like nobody's responding back to me. Okay. Yeah, you know? and uh, because I feel like, you know, there's a lot of old dudes, and they're supposed to be, you know, very special. Um, Muay Thai, you know, uh, practitioners or, or old teachers and stuff like that on that, on that team. But nobody's getting back to me because I feel like that would be a good source, you know, but you know what? I'm, I'm feeling like Alex is good. Yeah. Alex, I, I I'm going to have to like keep pressuring him, mm -hmm. you know, to try to dig, help me dig, 
you know. And I, I'm sure he has a lot of contacts uh, he does. doing the work that he does if he he's does. if he's dedicated his life to to doing this kind of work yeah. and research. And I want to say too, like you know, if you're Thai and you know you you appreciate your culture and um, because a lot of it was destroyed too, you know, by the Burmese and and you just got you gotta save your culture, you know. Don't don't forget about it. And and if you want to contribute, please. Like my wife even said, like I think she said, if what was it? She said, yeah, I think it was only a hundred people that donated like twenty dollars. You already, you You're know, there. what I mean. And then and and you know, I used to donate to other people's causes too. You know. Yeah, absolutely. And and the way I figured was that hey, if I'm going to be spending. I'd rather if I'm going to be spending sixty dollars on a game or whatever, I might as well just give the sixty dollars to this person who who needs it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And that was my mentality going into donating something to somebody. You know, and but you know it's really hard to ask Americans for anything because especially like nowadays, like you hear about all these scams and stuff like that that yeah. people do and. Um, it, it it sucks, you know. Yeah, I definitely understand why people are trepidatious to give out money. Yeah, and then but we I also have we, that me first attitude too. Yeah, yeah, but I think a lot of people actually do have it to give, and you know, people are going and spending ten bucks on a drink at Starbucks every morning, and you yeah. know, you really like throwing the money all around. And so, some people who have it to give, when they see people like you doing things that you're fully putting your heart into. You're not trying to scam anybody. All of it's going directly back into your culture and your appreciation. Mm -hmm. And you're doing it with honor and respectful attitude. And it's 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 a labor of love. And I think people really, when they see your work, will feel that and understand it and know that there's no scam in it at all. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I would encourage people to give a dollar, give $5, $20, fund the whole damn thing. You know, like uh, I, I support it wholeheartedly. I don't have a ton of money to give, but that's why I'm super enthusiastic about uh, and excited to have had you on the show. Thank so we you. can hopefully promote this as best we can get the word out there. I think, I think it's going to be huge, man. I'm really, really excited for you. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and I hope, you know, people can help out and I just want to, you know, I want to do that. I, 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 that's sometimes I just, I get weary because I feel like, I don't know if, um, I have faith in humanity, but sometimes it's a little bit lost, especially the way things are going right now and in, in the country and uh, anti anything that's not American, you know yeah. what I mean? And, but I feel like, um, don't let the media scare you off, man. <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll try to put all that shit in your head. But like, there's, like you said in the beginning, when you actually talk to people and you're in front of them, you see, mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, you're filled with love. Mm -hmm. Why did I think that you were a hate monger? Like, you actually care. <laughs> like, I mean, I've even, you know, I've gotten into conversations I found myself in with people I really disagree with who are fervent Trump supporters. And mm -hmm. I, at first I thought they were joking. And then they start to talk and I'm like, oh, you care about all the same things I care about, mm -hmm. but you are filled with fear. And for some, whatever reason, you think this is the best way to get your needs met. Mm -hmm. So they're just scared and they don't know what to do. And so that comes off as like push everything I don't understand away. Yeah. But really, like they just want all the same love that everybody else does. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised when you like... I think when like this gets out there for a little bit longer and more people have a chance, mm -hmm. you'll see like... Uh, I hear this a lot when people start putting themselves out there, like their faith in humanity gets restored mm -hmm. or especially, you know, I got a, a buddy of mine who hiked the Pacific crest trail from Mexico to, to Canada, that, that trail. Mm -hmm. And he did a podcast about it. And one of the things I heard almost every episode, people were like, like uh, their faith in humanity was restored. Cause when they were down and out, somebody came to their rescue. And like mm -hmm. when, when we have needs, the universe provides and it often does so through other people. Mm -hmm. So don't, don't let uh, the media and, and these hard times like make you too jaded. Cause mm -hmm. I, I, you've got a lot of love to give and that definitely um, is contagious and people will reciprocate. So mm -hmm. keep, keep your head up, man. It's, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. I think it's more my network too. Um, I need to find out like who's very influential to, um, or if anybody out there, you know, I, I, I think, the ones that matter to to the most, I would say, is um, people who love uh, people who love Muay Thai and and um, 
are a part of Thai culture, you know, Thai people, because um, it's part of our identity, whether, whether some people don't want to accept it or not, but Thai, Muay Thai is Thai culture. Yeah, Because absolutely. It, it's what um, helped us, uh, you know, survive. Um, well, they called it Muay Baran back in the day, and it's just different forms of, like, fighting, and you had weapons that went along with it, too. Um, I think it's called, like, Krabi Kerbong. Um, but it is part of Thai culture and, um, I feel like a lot of it's been lost and I need to, I need to help at least my part, you know, preserve that, that little part for other people to enjoy and, um, hear the story about one of the greatest Muay Thai fighters of all time. I'm not trying to like, you know, um, I don't want to be cocky about it, but, I I just found that it's just super cool and and he was one of the like he was the top fighter you know like, until he got murdered yeah and and he was a handsome guy man and that's what you know all, all the people were saying and my family and um, I can imagine you know uh, how popular he was and and people like that you know even I see it here in America when we have like a you know, decent looking guy or whatever, that's a champ, you know, everybody flocks to him and everybody wants to, you Especially know. Especially when they're a nice guy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it, man. I love the work you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to share with anybody before we, we wrap it up? Yeah. Anything just you want to say to people? Don't be afraid to hit me up, you know. I'm not a, I'm not a jerk, you know. <laughs> I, I'll vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do my best to, like, get back to you in a timely manner. And if you have any suggestions, you know, just throw it my way and, and, if you know any influential people that, you know, might want to like, you know, get involved in this, because remember, this is not just because this is documentary one documentary two will come out once I get the, uh, all the information that I can gather in my next trip in Thailand. Yep. New information kind of sometimes comes in my way, like news articles or whatever, uh, sometimes weekly or monthly. And then third, we're going to try to do something like Hollywood. Yeah. You know, either it's a, a you know, a narration by Sok Chai or that that's more of like a, like a documentary thing that that's not a major film or a major film because I've seen some Muay Thai major films that were just, bleh. they was all hyped up and it turned out to be boring. Yeah. And I'm not yeah. going to say any names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yours has no hype and it's exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm so excited for people to see it. Yeah. Cool, Pat. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, we'll have all the links to all of uh, the the pertinent places: Nakamoy LA, mm-hmm. the GoFundMe page. You can put up my art, art, my artwork too. Yeah, yep. sure. You put your art on there, your girl's art on there. I think we're gonna end here, uh, but I'd love to have you back sometime. Maybe we can follow up, see where you've been, but maybe also pick apart your art because we didn't really get into that's cool to the to the art so much because uh, I'm I'm fascinated by by the the work you do in the artistic realm as well. Thank you. Cool, man. We're going to wrap it up here. All Thank right. you so much for coming in. Cool. Awesome show. All right, man. Okay, what did you think? That was my conversation with Pat Cornett. Head over to Pat's YouTube channel, Nakmui LA. Watch his documentary about his granduncle, Sukchai Nakpayak, as well as his many other wonderful videos. And if you have it in you, head over to GoFundMe and make a financial contribution to Pat's fundraiser. He would really love to be able to go back to Thailand and uncover more stories and artifacts to preserve the legend of his granduncle for the sake of Thai and Muay Thai culture. All the links you need are at aflareforthecurious.com and in the show notes to this episode. That said, you can also find a way to contact us there. I would love to get some feedback. Let me know what you thought. I was a little nervous for this episode, but I assure you my interview style is chilling out as things are going on. Be sure to tune in for the next episode. Subscribe so you get the uh, notice or the download or whatever it is you get on your podcast app. Because next week we're going to talk to Monica Munoz, my friend and yoga mentor. She is from Puerto Rico, and we're going to get into some recent developments in that neck of the woods as well as the ongoing conversation about the changing roles of the teacher-student relationship in the era of Me Too. All right, again, all the links you need are at aflareforthecurious.com. I would love to get some feedback. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope you liked it. And I 
wish you all the best. Stay curious. Never stop asking questions and keep your heart open. Have a great day, everybody.